Consider this your stay-at-home special. This is a collection of allegedly true scary stories that happened in the woods that I've read in the past that will help to remind you that being indoors isn't so bad after all, because the woods is a scary place. If you've had a scary experience of your own, share it with us at darkstories.org for a chance to have it narrated. And if you enjoy these stories, or you support what I do, like this video and share it with your friends and family. Now then, enjoy. Still Like a Statue, from John Extravagance. In July of 2008, I was taking a road trip across the southern United States. I only had a couple of weeks before I would begin university, and I had just moved on from a breakup. So I decided to go on a solo road trip before summer break ended. My plan was to begin in Nashville, Tennessee, camp at some national parks in Alabama, go to a beach or two in Florida, then finish it all off with Baton Rouge, Louisiana. At this point of the trip, I was in Alabama. The first national park I intended to go to in Alabama was the Bankhead National Forest, which, if you've ever seen it on a map or in person, you know it's fairly big and desolate. But I liked it that way, because I don't get to see a whole lot of genuine nature where I live. Anyway, I get to the National Forest at around mid-morning, so between 9 and 11 a.m., I basically do all of the stuff that a nature-loving person would do at a national forest. Hike, fish, etc. At around 7 p.m. or so, it starts getting dark, so I find a camping area and begin pitching up my tent for the night. When looking around, I noticed that there were only two other tents in the whole camping area, one of which packed up and left right as I arrived. In the slight brightness from the setting sun, I could see the silhouette of a person sitting up in the single remaining tent. They weren't moving at all. This gave me the impression that they were staring at me, but I just didn't pay any mind to it and continued on with making my tent. Right when I sat down in front of the fire, I truly take in how quiet it is outside, even considering it was just me and some other person out here. It was like something was spooking the wildlife. There just wasn't much sound, and it was making me feel unnerved. As time passed, I realized that my firewood stash was dwindling, so I went into the surrounding tree line with my flashlight to get some more. I guess I got carried away, because before I even thought about it, I was a couple hundred feet into the tree line, a bit of a ways away from the camping area. As I began to walk back, I realized that it wasn't the same path I originally took, as where I was walking would bring me right where the other person's tent was. I turn off my flashlight so as to not startle whoever was in there, and I started to walk by the tent, but not too close. At this point, my eyes had just adjusted to the darkness, and when I walked near the person's tent, I took a quick glance inside, and what I saw had now made me completely unsettled. In the moonlight, I saw the person sitting straight up in the tent just as I saw them before a couple of hours ago, still not moving an inch, not making a single sound. Though I was close enough and it was quiet enough outside, I should have been able to hear them breathing. I wasn't close enough to make out exact features but close enough to confirm that this was a human being, not a pile of something like equipment making a human silhouette. Keep in mind that the surrounding nature was still quiet, so if this person had previously laid down and sat up, I would have been able to hear it. The only explanation I could think of would be that this person had literally been sitting there in their tent, motionless in the same exact position for several hours. I hadn't heard a single thing from their tent since I arrived. I took this all in as I was walking by the tent, never stopping or even looking back. 
When I got back to my campsite, I called it a night right then and there, dunking some water in the fire and then going to bed. I lay there, questions running through my head like, did that car that left right when I came here have something to do with this? Is this guy on drugs? Is he going to rob me in my sleep? Is he even alive? Despite the stress, I was exhausted, and I eventually fell asleep. I woke up a couple of hours later, and not sure why at first. I almost began to sit up in my sleeping bag, but I caught myself when I saw the same person that I saw before, in the same stance, still motionless, but now somehow, they were a couple of inches in front of my tent. I had to try extremely hard to both keep quiet and not have a heart attack right then and right there. The person sat there, absolutely as motionless as before, their shadow being cast across the tent. I closed my eyes, blinking away fearful tears, hoping for whoever this was to go away. But they stayed there, seemingly looking at my tent. At this point, I prayed to God that they never noticed that I had woke up. I don't know when, but eventually I fell back to sleep and woke up just when the sun was rising. I opened my eyes for a brief moment, enough to confirm that there was no longer anyone at my tent. But I would lay there for another 15 minutes, still horrified that the person could be close still. But eventually, I mustered up the courage to zip open my tent. I took a quick glance at the other campsite. Their tent was still there, but the flap was open now, and from where I was looking, no one was inside anymore. The person was still out there somewhere, probably watching me from the woods. I didn't even try to disassemble my tent as I just took out all the stakes, stuffed the whole thing into my trunk, and started to book it out of there, like I was trying to break a world record. When I was getting to open my car door, however, I stopped, and I saw that the words, you shouldn't cry, were drawn by someone's finger on the sheen of dirt on my driver's side window. Questions still come to my mind every once in a while about this whole thing. I saw some guy leaving in a car soon after I got to the camping area. Did he have any connections to this person? Or had he had the same terrifying experience? How was that person standing so perfectly still, but at the same time felt like they could attack me at any moment? Was it just some hillbilly trying to scare one single guy they didn't even know? Uh, this was 11 years ago, so I'll probably never know, but maybe that's for the better. Something in the Wilderness, from Air Force 123. This happened two years ago when I visited a friend down at the countryside. My friend Cody lived in a pretty decent-sized house with a barn in their backyard. I remembered the woods were located at about 100 yards away from the property. Cody and I were friends since high school, and we'd always enjoyed talking about guns, fishing, and hunting. One summer day, he invited me over to his house to try out his new rifle that he had just purchased. Now his property was big enough to discharge a firearm on, because there wasn't anyone living nearby. It would be about a 15 minute drive to a nearby town. So as I got to his house, he showed me his AR-15, which I couldn't wait to shoot. I remembered Cody's brother was 12 years old at the time, so he just stayed in his room playing video games, ignoring us while we were in the backyard minding our own business. As we enjoyed our time, I asked my friend if there were any deer in the woods, of course there were, but this was my way of asking how ripe they were, how many there were. He said he had seen a few lately, but wolves and coyotes a couple of times too, 
and that he was afraid they would start dwindling down the number of deer. I think the conversation caused him to switch gears, because he suddenly asked if I wanted to go hunting. Now, I'm not a big fan of hunting, but I did want to go out into the woods, and maybe I'd earn myself some deer steak in the process. I answered, sure. We went back to the house, prepared a bit, then journeyed into the woods. I remembered checking the time as we entered the tree line to see that it was 6.57 p.m. As it was summer, the sky was still bright. The birds and insects chirped as normal, all while we walked down this path. A while later, we sat down on a rock and started whispering. Is this your usual spot? I asked. He shook his head, saying that he had only been here to hunt once before. As we continued to whisper chat, I spotted something moving about 30 yards away from us. I nudge his shoulder and point over in that direction. Do you see that? I ask. I bet I can nail it from here, I said. Cody laughed, and he took aim at the thing himself. He looked down the scope. Looks like a deer. Even I got excited when he said that. Maybe we were going to bag something today, and even faster than I expected. But then I heard him swallow down hard, lower the scope a moment, then looked back. What's wrong? I asked. I, I don't know. There's like this red stuff all over its face, and all over its legs. I had brought some miniature binoculars. I whipped them out, hoping that they'd be strong enough to see the deer from here. They were. I immediately asked, Whoa, dude, are the deer usually that big here? Not really. After he answered, the deer disappeared into some bushes, and right after that, Cody got up, wanting to follow it as quietly as possible, probably not wanting to let a deer that big be passed up. But before we got anywhere, we heard Cody's brother calling us from the house. Cody rolled his eyes, but then I noticed something weird. I thought he had been yelling at us from the house, but then I realized we were deep into the woods and the path before us led back out, but the voice was coming from a different direction. That's not right, Cody said. Maybe it's just an echo bouncing off the hills, I replied. I don't know about that. The yelling repeated, never sounding any closer, but somehow it had the same sound to it, repeated perfectly, identical to the last. It was weird, but not enough to spook us out of the woods. That is, until Cody looked back into the rifle scope and nearly dropped the gun entirely. Cody, man, what's going on? T take a look. I looked into my binoculars, and what I saw was so insane that I still don't believe it myself. The deer was back. It had come out of the bushes it had exited from before. And every time we heard his brother shout, the deer opened its mouth and closed it the moment the yelling stopped. It did this with every set of yells, like someone mouthing with a sock puppet. No way, I said. It had to be some disturbing coincidence, right? Besides, if his brother was yelling, he'd had to have come all the way out to the start of the trail at least for us to hear him. And then Cody got a text. A text which read, You guys coming back? Mom and Dad won't start dinner till you get back. I felt chills go down my spine. I pulled out my pistol, pointing it towards the bush, and Cody said that we need to walk slowly back through the path. But what happened next gave me chills. As we walked slowly onto the path, the deer that had been over a hundred yards away seconds ago poked its red matted face out from a nearby bush and stared at us, its mouth hanging open as the yell came again from the wrong direction. 
My mind was racing with questions I didn't think I would ever ask. How can a deer talk? Is it human somehow? If not, what the hell is it? Suddenly, a loud bang had me covering my ears. I looked over and saw that Cody had fired a shot at it. The deer's face had been pulled back into the bush, and we took the opportunity to run as fast as we could back to the house. When we made it back, it was 8.30 p.m., but there was no way we had been gone longer than 30 minutes. After all, we had entered the woods at 6.57. We actually ended up sharing this story with Cody's parents that night, but bizarrely enough, Cody's dad had his own similar story. He said he believed us, because creepily enough, one night when he had trouble sleeping, he went to grab a glass of water. It was 1 a.m. He heard Cody's voice calling from outside, asking his dad to come out to him. That didn't make sense because the dad had just passed Cody's door and Cody was sound asleep. To this day, Cody and I are still great friends. He moved out of that place several months ago. I wonder what would have happened if he had stayed there. I wonder what other creepy experiences they'd have to share. Goat Man in the Mountains from DJ Electric Zone I was young and my imagination was wild, but what I'm about to tell you still terrifies me. This was not my imagination. I had gone camping in the mountains. It was a two-week excursion that soon turned to hell. It was a night for telling stories, scary stories. We were near a fence, and I was sitting with my back against it. It was a barbed wire fence, and there were bushes growing on the other side. The fence was there because we raised farm animals, including horses and fowl. The fence was supposed to help keep Coyote out, but they always found a way in. Anyway, there were 17 people in our camp altogether, girls and boys, each of us just chit-chatting and sharing stories. When suddenly, a branch broke right behind me, forcing me, as well as a lot of the guys around me, to nearly jump in the fire pit to get away. We were so spooked, we just stared off into the wilderness for a second everyone quiet, waiting for something to happen. After several minutes, we decided to sit back down. Obviously, it was nothing, so we continued what we were doing, until I heard a different sound from right behind me, just beyond the fence. Hey. I nearly soiled myself as I jumped up and turned around. Imagine that feeling when you think a spider is on your neck or something but multiply it by 10. That's how I felt when I heard that voice. But when I turned, I didn't see anything, save for the movement in a bush. I swear to God, it was like someone or something was taunting us. I wasn't the only one that heard that voice either. When I felt comfortable enough to look away from those bushes, the guys around me looked so spooked that they were huddling together, shaking and looking into the woods. I can't blame them. I still had an extra layer of goosebumps all over me. Peter, the tallest guy of the group, suddenly got up and yelled into the forest. That's not funny. Stop it. Obviously fed up with someone who he thought was pranking us. The next thing we know, a dozen or so deer run right out of the woods not even caring that a group of people were camping nearby. They were running desperately away from something. They were just as scared as we were. But what was the cause? What lurked out there that was terrifying everything around us? Even the horses were stampeding off into the distance toward the opposite side of the field. I asked the group if they wanted to head back to the cottages, and they all agreed. Not a single person out there wanted to stay out here any longer. We packed up at a record speed and made it back to the cottages extremely fast. 
But before we did make it back, I gotta say that we smelled something very terrible. It was a stench I'd never experienced on this land before. A strong odor of rotten eggs and rotting animal. Anyway, we got in away from that smell, away from the night, hoping that would be the end of it. When we headed to bed, the strangest series of sounds erupted from the forest that we had just escaped from. They kept coming and coming all night, echoing throughout the land. Despite locking all the doors and windows, these sounds were clear as day, almost paranormally unimpeded by the structure of the cottage around us. As for the sounds themselves, it was like a thousand different animals writhing around in pain in one single spot. The way I imagined it in my head, I could see a thousand different animals writhing in a tar pit, crying and screaming out in pain to no avail. But that wasn't right, because we just saw every species of animal exit that forest at a rapid rate. Sure, maybe a few were left behind and stayed there, but not thousands. Most of us couldn't sleep, but we laid still and quiet in the dark, trying to sleep or trying to stay calm. One of the girls got up and looked out the window, looking back toward the campsite, and I heard her audibly gasp. We all did. What's wrong? I asked. Given the situation, seeing a look on her face like that was something to deeply worry me. She replied, I, I thought we put the fire out. The moment she said that, me, along with a few other of the guys, got up and swarmed the window to get a good look at what was going on. Where we had been camping, I could see the fire pit, and it was lit, even though we had put it out with dirt. Yet there it was, like we never did. And then, we all gasped at the same time, because a small, hunched, human-like figure stepped right out of the tree line, walked up to the fire, and stood over it, seeming to shiver as it tried its best to stay still. Who is that? The girl said, still standing and staring at the window. But none of us had an answer. The next morning, in broad daylight for sure, we went to investigate our campsite. We found quite a mess. The bushes by the fence had been uprooted and torn to shreds. The fence itself had a massive hole in it, as if someone or something had crossed through. The fire pit had been stomped into an ash pancake, basically. Yet somehow, nowhere around us was there a single footprint, save for hours from the previous night. Ever since these events, I've wondered what it was we encountered or nearly encountered back then. What if it was the goat man? A strange prankster-like creature up in the mountains, mimicking voices, scaring us for the fun of it, only vaguely human in shape. It had to have been the goat man, or a highly elaborate prank. Either way, this was enough to scare us out of camping in that area for a very long time and I highly doubt anyone had the time, energy, or money to prank us all like that. And if they did, what was the reward? What was the point? The Thing in the Woods from Dorado 15 About a year ago, a few friends and I were camping in New Jersey we had set up off a hiking trail, but had made sure not to go too far off the trail because one of our friends was exhausted and was easily scared anyway. So for his sake, we didn't go too deep. I grew up in the woods most of my life. I had no problem going in there by myself in the dark or any time really. Our plan was to camp for three days, then leave to the shore to spend some time at the water. The first day went very well, had a lot of fun talking, hanging out, telling stories, and especially eating sausages and marshmallows by the fire. 
it was on the second night that we were there that some very weird things were happening. Growing up in the woods all my life, I could tell when things did not seem right. Imagine someone moving things around in your room. The next time you walk in, you'll know something's up. Well, on the second day, I walked down from the camp in the morning to use the restroom. Not the actual restroom, just to relieve myself. I walked a few minutes in, because I didn't want my friends, who are quite the pranksters, to try and mess with me. As soon as I stopped, the sound of my footsteps crunching leaves stopped, revealing that the woods around me had been silent for an unknown amount of time. In the mornings out here, you would expect birds to be singing or flying around at the very least, but there wasn't a single noise. It was so quiet, my ears began ringing, and I could soon hear my own heartbeat. I swallowed hard. My first thought was, there's probably a mountain lion in the area, and that maybe I should head back and use the restroom later. Suddenly, a large whoosh of wind hit me in the side. It seemed to have come out of nowhere, yet somehow did not disturb a single leaf or tree. It wasn't like wind at all, and was more like something exhaling. I held it in and jogged back to camp. I saw that my friends were standing there quietly. I asked them if they were okay, but they were freaked out about how quiet it was too. We sat down for maybe an hour, sweating, not talking to each other, waiting desperately for the sound to return. And after the longest hour ever, it finally all came back. That night, we were sleeping in our tents when one of my friends woke me up. He told me to be quiet and listen before I could say a word. I did as he told me, and I could hear footsteps just outside the tent. Heavy. You could hear the force with which they were landing on the ground. My friend, who didn't like to think things through, decided it would be a good idea to peek through the opening of the tent a small bit. The moment the shadowy darkness from outside peeks into the tent and hits his eye, he jumps back in obvious shock. I asked him what he saw, and replied by saying, There's a horse outside. A, a horse? I almost laughed. I was so relieved I opened the tent and looked out, and standing no more than ten feet from us, was definitely not a horse. This was a creature I'd never seen before. I can't say for sure how tall it was, but it was well above me, and I'm 5'10". It had black hair, legs that were hairy, long, and hoofed. It had a tail, but its front legs were more like arms, with claws at the end. Five claws. And the first thing that was a dead giveaway that this was no horse were its massive wings. They cast a shadow over our tent, even at that distance. Its face looked like a horse, sure, but it was a very strange face, one that was more rot than flesh. I stared at it for a few seconds, until someone screamed. The thing took off, flapping its wings. I don't think it left the ground, but it definitely tried to. Before I knew it, it was gone. The scream had come from one of my other friends in a separate tent. They'd come out to use the restroom, and saw that thing, and of course got the fright of their life. We packed up and left, and without a word we all agreed. What we just saw had to have been the Jersey Devil. And despite having never believed that story, there was no dissuading me now, because nothing else makes sense. A random mutation in a horse that major wouldn't just magically match the old legend. That was the legend itself. La Llorona from Cara D. 
This story is from my dad. It happened when he was just a boy. Back then, he was living in El Salvador. It was a foggy night when he and his two uncles, Miguel and Carlos, were going out to the lake. Carlos had brought a gun with him. It was always smart to have some form of protection with you when you went out at night. That night, the lake was quiet, but half an hour into their excursion, they began to hear these noises. It was the obvious sound of a woman sobbing. Miguel and Carlos started to gather their things. My dad asked them what was going on, and they told him it was La Llorona, that when you heard a woman crying in the middle of the night, it was best to hide. As they were out on the water, Miguel began to row back, but progress back to land was slow, as it usually is in a rowboat. But what scared my dad was the fact that the sobbing was getting closer to them, even though they were in the middle of a lake. That was physically impossible. If a crying woman really was in the water and swimming towards them, they would have heard a splash. They would have heard her moving through the water. All they heard was crying. My dad was told to duck down into the boat so that he could not be seen. And seconds later, Carlos fired the rifle. My dad was horrified, but they made it back to land okay, jumped into the car, and drove until the sound of crying could no longer be heard. The uncles explained to my father that when you hear the crying and you're a child or have children, they must hide because if they are seen by La Llorona, she will take them away forever. What do the crow feathers mean? From Wicca Boo. Growing up as a little girl in the backwoods of rural eastern Pennsylvania, I learned a lot of things. I learned how to make a fort. I learned what plants I could eat and want to avoid. I learned how to tell what track belonged to which animal. And most importantly, I learned what places I should never go. My earliest memory of the 200 acres of state game land that our property set in the middle of was something I'll never forget. At the age of around six or seven, I can remember that one day that I heard mewing coming from under the porch. When I peered under the wooden steps, I stumbled upon two very different cats. My mother came home to find me grass-stained and sitting with a fluffy black and white kitten and a scraggly old gray cat with matted fur. Not until she called my name did I turn to face her with a cut across my face. Right then, she knew that we'd have to name them. So we did. Baby and Scar. I came home every day to play with these cats until my mom decided that we couldn't take care of them both, and my neighbor adopted Baby, the cute little kitten, leaving me stuck with Scar. Scar was a strange cat. As much as I loved and enjoyed him, he of course was not my cat so much as nature's cat. He would always leave me dead things like birds and mice to clean up. Scar knew how to survive and thrive in the woods, he seemed to know every path hiding in the whole game lands. Although Scar, the beast, would wander off always, he never failed to be waiting for me back at home. So of course, I was surprised when I got home from school one day, and my lovely Scar was nowhere to be found. I decided, of course, I would find him. I trekked off into the woods past the stream on the property and into dense forest, the trees waved in the slight breeze and the sun shone overhead. Birds chirped and leaves rustled. Despite how distraught I was about possibly losing my beloved little monster of a cat, I was beginning to enjoy myself on this walk. Just as soon as I began humming to myself, I could hear a mewing off in the distance. Of course, that makes so much sense that Scar would know my voice. That's what I thought, 
so I bolted in the direction of the meow. Soon I found that the sound of my feet crunching the leaves below blocked out the subtle mewing in the distance. I slowed down to realize that I no longer heard my scars meows, and I heard absolutely nothing at all. The only noise that was made were my footsteps. The birds had stopped their songs, and the woods' movement from the wind had gone dead still. The sun had now fallen behind some clouds, creating a thin shadow of darkness under the already blackened tree coverage. Due to this silence, my ears sharpened. My other senses seemed to focus, too. I looked around, wondering where I was, and if I could even get back. I thought about how my mom must have gotten home by now. She'd be so mad at me for running off in the middle of nowhere before she got home. My eyes focused on a cleared spot in the dense brush. I realized I'd found a trail. My survival guide brain kicked in and I rationalized that it must lead somewhere, so I figured I could follow it and eventually get home, or at the very least to a road. I began to walk, and walk, and walk. I began to notice something that piqued my attention. I always kept my eyes at my feet while I walked, because I was a clumsy child, and I was afraid I would trip over a root or twig. So when I was staring at my little boots in the mud and leaves, I began to notice a color that you don't always see in nature. Bright red. I inspected the leaf with the dense red liquid on it, and I knew what it was. I'd seen blood before, as I had scraped my knees pretty bad many times. At first, my mind began racing. Would I find Scar? Would he be... dead? No, 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 no. Just, just keep walking. Follow the trail. The blood followed the trail too, though. Every step I walked to avoid the drips and drops and splatters. But my little mind was relieved when the blood had feathers instead of cat fur. The shiny black feathers were large and had a green tint to them. I figured at some point I'd find the animal they belonged to, all mangled and no longer living. I was dreading that scene until I had an epiphany. Perhaps my scar had killed many a small creatures. He'd left a trail of blood up my wooden porch dozens of times, leaving us plenty of little cat presents. This had to be him. Had to be my scar. I raced and dashed among the branches and ferns. Somewhere the blood led. Somewhere that my scar would be. I just knew it. My heart skipped a beat as I stepped and my shoe got stuck under a log, sending me flying forward. I had skidded across the forest floor and my shoe got taken off, still wedged under the log. My arm had hit a rock and it tingled, but I found myself brushing off my clothes and hopping back up. I was okay. I refocused. I was following a trail. A... A trail. My eyes beaded back and forth for the trail, but it was gone. Where had it gone? It was just there. I frantically turned, searching for that familiar crimson color that I'd followed for what must have been miles, but it was gone. I abruptly sat there and cried. I knew it. That was Scar, and I had no hope of finding him. Just as I opened my eyes, wiping tears away, my vision corrected and revealed yet another color that you rarely see in nature. Fluorescent pink. I knew that color, though. It was the one my dad used to mark the trees on our property line. The ones he never got around to cutting down. I knew where to go now. If I just run towards the tree, my house would come into view soon after. So that's what I did, 
For the last time, I ran overjoyed to be in a familiar place. Just as my driveway came into view, my mother's car was pulling into the parking spot. I ran to her and hugged her with the biggest six-year-old squeeze. She smiled at me and said, You're sure happy to see me. I pleaded with her not to punish me, that I was sorry for being gone so long. She frowned and scolded me for being in the woods alone, but said she had no idea what I was talking about. She had just got home. My mom got home from work every day only 20 minutes after I got home from school. This did not make sense, though. I'd been gone for several hours, lost in the trees, following a feathery, bloody trail. My little kid brain wasn't too bothered by that gap in time, however. The only thing that mattered was that I was home. I was safe. I was secure with my mom. When I pulled away out of her arms, I noticed something behind her. The crimson drips across the concrete that formed a walkway to my porch. He was home. I knew it this time. I jumped across the concrete, turning toward my deck toward the stairs. I was right. Scar had come home to me just as I'd wished. I expected to see him there, with a crow jutting from his jaws. And though this was nearly the case, something was wrong. I fell backward, and a wave of dread crashed over me. My scar had come home, all right, but he had been mangled and crushed with fresh blood still creating little plops on the steps below. His gray stripes could barely be seen under the coat of deep color liquid. His limbs seemed to have been pulled from their sockets, dislocated and broken. He had become a mess of a carcass, nearly unrecognizable, but I knew it was him. I could always tell him apart, for as much as no one would believe, he was my cat. The only distinguishing thing in this mass of mess was a single reflecting crow's feather. Now, let me fill you in on some things that you didn't know before. Things that I certainly didn't know when I was six years old. Our woods were on Native American land, or what used to be their land. There are three signs outside of the development that talk about how the natives gave the land to the pioneers, and however quirky and nice that sounds, it's simply not the truth. I soon found out that the land was sacred and had been stolen from the tribes. One of the signs that is very dilapidated states that there was a wagon trail that led the mountaineers here, and they started building mines under where all the houses are. In fact, there are these old mountaineer homes that are abandoned on a trail near my own house. Every time I explored one of these houses, I found a new dead creature. Not freshly dead, usually just bones. There used to be a dead crow nailed to the ceiling of one of the houses. However, it has since been moved by someone or something. Lastly, during my trip to a clearing behind my home, I found an arrowhead in the dirt. This land is now mostly owned by the state, but my house is here, and I know it was never meant to be. I've come to the conclusion that some sort of native curse or entity had killed my cat, leaving the feather as a sign. I know that the crow feathers must mean something because I would always continue to find them wherever I found dead animals. I know it sounds odd, unbelievable even. I wish I could be more informed on the subject. But believe me when I say the last thing I want to do is to anger the natives and their spirits. Werewolf of Monroe Lake from Danny Joe My brother and I went on a fishing trip to Monroe Lake in Indiana. We've been there hundreds of times before, all over the place. We left on a Friday morning and got there Friday late afternoon. 
We brought a John boat and some basic essentials, like a tent, my gun, just a small 38 Special revolver, his gun, a 22 lever action rifle, and some firewood. We didn't bring much food, because we thought we'd just eat fish and some small game if needed. We loaded everything into the boat and went off. It was quickly getting dark though, and the only light we had were the ones on the boat, and a small flashlight. After being on the water for about an hour, we found a small cove really perfect for us, because it was out in the middle of nowhere. We could fish any way we wanted. We unloaded the boat and set up camp. My brother got a fire going, and I began fishing because I was getting hungry. After a few minutes, the crickets just stopped chirping. I wasn't getting any bites either, so I figured it was a better time than any to start walking back to camp. We set up about 20 yards from the boat. When I got back to my brother, I asked him if he noticed the lack of sounds around us, and he replied, no, I didn't really notice till now. Then, together as we listened, we heard a loud howl that sounded like it was about a mile away. Chills went down my spine, and my brother began to tremble. I could see it in his hands. I spoke. That was creepy, but what are we doing, dude? We're both grown men. Nothing we can't handle. Yeah, he said. Probably a coyote. We both decided to lie down in the tent and call it a night, but I got my gun out just to be safe, because a mile out here in the woods isn't very far. The next morning we woke up and got the day started. We thought we'd go and see if we could find the footprint or scat trail of a coyote, figuring that's what we heard last night. We ventured about 500 yards into the woods from our camp when we came up on a small coyote, but the thing had been ripped to shreds. My brother was curious as to what had done this, possibly another coyote, a bear or mountain lion. But after seeing this, I was more interested in going back to camp. We got back and I went for my phone to text my dad. I asked what big predators live out here that could take down a coyote. It took a minute or two before he texted back. He replied, maybe some cougars, but not much else. So I figured it was either that or just a bigger coyote. We decided to only stay one more night, as we didn't want to be attacked by whatever did that. We went out on the boat for a while, fishing. We weren't having any luck on the cove, so we went to this rock face that we called Crappie Honey Hole, as we always caught crappie there. Finally, we started catching some fish, and we didn't stop until the sun began to set. We were both starving that day. Eventually, we called it a day and started back to camp. Our little boat didn't go very fast, but it was better than a canoe or a kayak. By the time we made it back to camp, it was completely dark, and it was quiet like it was the previous night. We slid the boat on the bank and started out. We made a beeline for the fire pit to cook up our catches, only to notice that our camp now looked like a war zone. Everything had been torn up and thrown around like someone was looking for something. We both grabbed our guns quickly and took off the safety, looking at each other with the same expression. Expressions that said, we're not alone out here. We didn't grab anything else, and we started to make our way to the boat. As we did, we began to hear a deep, gurgling growl. It was closer than the previous night. As we get to the boat, my brother grabs the flashlight and points it towards camp. The both of us stop. Fear like I'd never felt before filled my body because the flashlight revealed two big yellow eyes. They were about five feet off the ground. Both of us were trembling now, beginning to back up. My brother jumped into the boat. He pulled the ripcord, and the boat roared to life. I followed him into the boat, but I didn't take my eyes off of the thing in the woods. I crawled in, 
I looked away for less than a second, and when I looked back, the creature was gone. We pulled into the water, and I used the flashlight to look for the thing in the bushes, but it was nowhere to be found. We never thought to stay away from the bank and to get further away from it. We didn't think we'd be attacked out in the water. But we were wrong, because suddenly, to my right, the creature came rushing out of the bank. I saw it in detail then. It was more than six feet tall, with a body that was canine-like and human-like at the same time. I pointed the flashlight instinctively right at it, as if it was a gun and I was trying to protect myself. I could make out a piece of nylon sticking to one of its claws. A shred of our tent. I panicked and fell backward after that, pushing my brother out of the way to put the throttle on high. We barely made it out of that thing's clutches. I was wanting to get as far away as possible. We made it back to the boat ramp area, got the boat loaded in record time, and we booked it out of there in the truck. We didn't talk one bit all the way home, and never said much about this to mom or dad, even though they were concerned about where their tent went, as we had borrowed it. I'm in my thirties now, and I haven't been back to Monroe Lake. I'm scared to go back, and on the occasion my friends or family say that they're planning to go there, I try to convince them otherwise. Something on the Roof, from Sivan. I'm from the Philippines, which is a third world country. We have three major islands which are named Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. I live on the latter, in a rural area in Misamis Oriental. Our area here is pretty quiet, especially at night. But last week, when I was doing my chemistry homework... I heard a thud from the roof. I didn't pay much mind to it. This was normal because we have mango trees around and mangoes often fall from them and hit the roof. But as I continued to listen, these sounds continued and they had a pattern to them, like a person walking. When I realized that it was something walking around, I grew scared, not knowing what's out there. I slept on the sofa with the lights turned on that night. The following day, nothing really happened except for an announcement from my cousin, who said that she was pregnant. Our houses are inside one compound, making it close together, and when I heard her say that she was pregnant, I began to worry. A lot of folks in the Philippines are superstitious. We believe in mythical creatures, one of which is called the Tick Tick. It resembles a human, but with wings. In fact, it's featured in many of our films here. I was scared for her, but I didn't want her to worry, so I didn't mention what I'd heard the previous night. Instead, I congratulated her, and I wished her and her baby well. For the next week after that, I kept hearing it on the roof every night. It seemed to be looking for something. Something it never found, because after my cousin had her baby several months later, only then did the sounds stop. Alien in the Yard From Painted Dragon 90 This happened when I was 11 years old. My little brother was 8. We lived in a small town in Ohio, growing up surrounded by woods and lakes. The summer after our father left, we were left in the hands of a careless babysitter, who did nothing but smoke cigarettes and talk to her friends on the phone. She would leave us outside for several hours, to basically screw around until my mom got home. Again, I'll remind you, we lived in the middle of nowhere out here, and the nearby town was a small one. One day it was a particularly late evening, and my mom had not gotten home yet. Our babysitter sent us out into the backyard with a badminton set, and told us to play. My brother kept annoyingly hitting the birdie too hard, so we'd have to keep retrieving them from the thick woods behind the house. 
Eventually, we got bored with using birdies, so we switched over to tennis balls. Again, my brother was hitting them way too hard, and them being tennis balls, they rolled way past the tree line. Frustrated, I pointed in the direction where the ball disappeared, and I demanded that he get it. But he didn't want to go by himself. We walked into the brush, careful to avoid the poison ivy, and tried to locate the ball. We couldn't find it anywhere. But as we looked, we suddenly heard a noise, like sticks breaking. There was something else walking around out here. I was afraid we were a bit too close to a large animal, like a deer, or worse. I told my brother to head back inside, but he didn't go back. Instead, he froze there. I kept asking him what was wrong. What's going on with you, I said. But the only thing he could do was point. About 20 to 25 yards away from us, there was some kind of animal. From what I could make out, it had very large eyes and a tiny slit for a mouth. No nose, no hair, just like the gray aliens you see on TV. Safe to say my brother and I were both too terrified to move. After a few moments passed, the creature ducked behind the tree and disappeared. My brother and I slowly backed out of the woods and made it back to our house. When my mother got home from work, I tried to tell her everything that happened. But my brother would not agree with me. He refused to tell her the truth. He lied instead, saying that we hadn't seen anything. My brother and I shared a bedroom at the time that had a window facing the backyard. He and I went to bed, but did not go to sleep. Of course, that night I began complaining at my brother for what he'd done. How could he lie about that? Why would he make my mom think that I'm a liar? She thinks I'm crazy now, I thought. Just as I was berating him, we heard a thump at the window. My brother and I obviously immediately assumed the worst. We debated closing the blinds. Since I was on the top bunk, I could reach the string, but I really didn't want to move. I was so scared that that alien would see me. Eventually, I gathered the courage to get up and to pull the string. But as I got up to my knees to reach over, I made the mistake of glancing out the window. I immediately soiled myself. That thing, the exact thing we'd seen in the woods, it was staring at me, just staring with those big black eyes. My brother saw it too and began to scream and cry. My mom woke up, and she wasn't happy. Instead of explaining anything, we just sat there crying. I've never forgotten these events. To this day, I have no idea why my brother threw me under the bus. Even now, nearly 20 years later, my mom still thinks I made up the story, all because my brother wouldn't open his mouth. The Watchers from Dragonlord 2082 This happened in 2006 in northern Kentucky. We had been in our new house for roughly a year when I began noticing a dark figure watching our house from the trees. We had woods behind our house, and that's where I saw it. One day after coming home from work, I headed out to the backyard to work in the garden and to gather some fruits and vegetables to make dinner for the night. While out at the back part of the garden, I heard the crunching of leaves and sticks coming from the shallow woods. I didn't think much of it, as there was a heavily used game trail just inside the trees, so I figured it was some sort of animal. I continued what I was doing, then headed back into the house, but now I had a feeling that I was being watched. I stopped and looked around, but did not see anything. But it was pretty dark at that point. I headed into the house to help make dinner. After dinner, I started to do dishes, and happened to glance out the back window. And there, I saw a dark figure standing at the tree line. I turned around to yell for my wife, but when she finally came over to the kitchen window, the figure had left. 
Figuring my eyes were just playing tricks on me, I finished up the dishes and turned off the lights in the kitchen. I sat down in the living room to play some Xbox. It was around 12 a.m. when the back motion lights came on. That wasn't too abnormal because the neighbor had like 50 cats that would tramp through my yard at all hours of the day. So I ignored it and went back to playing my game. I'm not sure how long it was after the last time. You know how it is when you play a really good game and lose all track of time. But suddenly the back lights came on again. This time I paused the game and I got up to check it out. When I looked out the back door, there were no cats outside at all. But there was a dark humanoid figure moving around in the far back part of the yard towards the trees. I walked out the door onto the back deck to see if I could make out what it was. When I got outside, the figure froze and just stood still. It looked as if whatever it was had its gaze set on me. To test my idea, I moved around to see where its eyes would adjust. And sure enough, the eyes followed me. At this point, I have no idea what's going on or what the hell that thing is. So I backed up slowly while keeping my eyes on it as I went back into the house. I then turned off all the lights in the house and watched through the blinds. The figure didn't move for a while, so the back lights suddenly went out. I watched a bit longer, then went back to my bedroom. But as soon as I laid back in bed, the lights came back on. This time, I looked up from my bed, and there was a shadow just outside my bedroom window. I pulled the cover over my head, stifling a scream, and I shut my eyes. Eventually, I fell asleep like that. The next day was quiet, and everything seemed to go back to normal. Ever since then, I've seen this figure on occasion in my yard, until I was absolutely horrified to see it inside my house. Just outside my bedroom door, actually. This kept going until I moved out from that house. I don't miss it, and I hope those things don't follow me. A Face I Won't Forget From Black Flames 31 So this happened about a year ago. My friend John had been discussing the upcoming hunting season for mule deer here in southeast Idaho. He told me to go up a ridgeline near a place called Black Canyon. We discussed his recent trip up there and how there was a herd hanging around the area. You see, in Idaho, the deer are hard to find. The woods are so large there that an animal could go its whole life without seeing a single person. John and I had been discussing how I, a recently diagnosed type 1 diabetic, could find a deer that season without having to hike through miles upon miles of timber. As I was figuring out the details of my hunt in my head, John smirked and laughed to himself. I asked what was so funny. Ah, uh, my dad never goes up Black Canyon, John replied. I asked, why? He made a face and tried to imitate his dad's voice. There's something up there, drove off the bears onto the mine. John is a fairly no-nonsense person and his dad drinks a lot, so obviously he never takes his dad seriously. Well, I didn't think much of this info, so I forgot all about it. I figured a big sow with her cub was up there, and keeping everything away. So I started to prepare for my hunt after the conversation. I couldn't hike super far yet, so I bought a cheap tree stand. I'm pretty much the only person in town to use a tree stand here for deer hunting, so I got made fun of when people found out. I ignored them though. To heck if I was going to let diabetes take away my ability to hunt. I could still enjoy things. So I set up the stand on the edge of a small clearing up a black canyon with my dad. The clearing had plenty of deer signs, so we were in luck. There was also a well-established game trail nearby, so it was really turning out to be a great spot. A few weeks later, opening day, I got myself up to the tree stand and began to wait for deer. 
Morning soon turned to noon, and I still hadn't seen a thing. I took the moment to climb down to stretch my legs. I decided I'd take a nap at the base of the tree, so I laid against my pack and snoozed a bit. I woke up about an hour or two later. I immediately began hearing this weird sound coming from up the canyon. It was a whooping sound, and it was quite high-pitched. I was struggling to guess what it was coming from. After about five whoops, I heard another whooping sound from the east wall of the canyon, and then silence. The whole forest went silent at this. I climbed back into my stand. It was going to start getting dark soon, and the deer would be moving again. After a little while, I heard some brush moving, and I got my rifle ready. That's when a doe popped out of the brush with a fawn. But my tag was for a buck, so I just watched them bound past me. All of a sudden, I heard a loud crack, like a stick being broken in half after being stepped on. But this didn't sound like a stick. It was more like an entire tree had been snapped in half. I figured a moose was walking around, so I focused on the direction of the noise. I could see a black spot in between the trees, so I zeroed in on it with my scope. It took me a moment to register what I was looking at, but I realized that it was a face. A black face with a wide mouth, a flat nose, dark eyes, and it was staring back at me. It looked human, but not. It felt weird. I looked over its body. It was huge, definitely as big as a moose, but it was quite wide. Too wide to be a moose or a regular person. I don't remember much after that, because I heard the thing scream, and it was like ten semi-trucks roaring their engines all at once. It was terrifying. I fired in its direction. I probably missed, but it was enough to scare the thing away. I climbed down. I was getting out of there, but before I could get more than a few feet from my stand, I suddenly blacked out. I woke up with my dad kneeling over me. He had called me, but didn't get an answer, so he became concerned and came looking for me. I don't remember how he got me all the way to my car through those woods. All I know is that I haven't been in those woods since. I gave John the go-ahead to get my deer stand, and I told him he could even keep it. But when he found it, he told me a tree had fallen on the ladder and bent it up. I didn't know what to think of this. I don't think it was a tree that fell on it. I think that thing took a whack at it. So I wonder what would have happened to me if I hadn't left. I told my dad about the thing I saw. He said he believed me. He said, lots of weird things happen in the woods. <sighs> I plan on going back eventually, but not to Black Canyon and never alone, because I don't want to get caught alone with something like that again. It wasn't a cougar from Gavin D. My grandpa died when I was 10 years old. Believe it or not, he was attacked and killed by a mountain lion. The area we live in is known for them, and I've heard them at night. They're howls that sound like a woman being attacked. We lived in a small rural neighborhood in Arkansas where the nearest town is about 25 minutes drive away. So there's not much to do but swim, fish, and hunt. My grandpa used to hunt the area near the lake, as deer and other animals thrived around the lake during the winter and all year round. I used to go with him until I was around seven, when both my father and my grandpa told me I could no longer go hunting until they had taken care of more of the cougars that lived near the lake. Even though I was small, I'd always heard that cougars didn't usually attack people in groups, but I obeyed them without question. Sometimes, though, my family would go to the lake to camp or have a picnic. 
My father always told my sister and I to stay away from the darker area of the woods near the lake, always justifying his orders, saying they couldn't keep an eye on us if we went in there, or that it was very sneaky. We obeyed him, of course. I'm 17 now. I often take walks to the lake with my dog Heinrich, who's a two-year-old German shepherd. The lake is about five miles away from my house, so the walk takes a little more than an hour. I left the house one morning in the late spring to walk and clear my mind a bit, as my parents recently divorced, and my search for a job wasn't really going well. I absolutely loved nature. It has always comforted me. I told my dad where I was going and what time I planned to be back. I left with my 45 and a machete, and Heinrich happily followed me because he knew where I was going. It was a beautiful day out, not a cloud in the sky, and the wind was calm. After walking about 45 minutes, Heinrich started barking and ran after a large rabbit. I wanted to go after him, but he always came back, eventually. I kept going, and as I was about 10 to 15 minutes from the lake, I heard a really strange noise. It was like a painful groan, but from an animal. It sounded roughly like a dog or an injured deer. I feared Heinrich had come across a mountain lion, somehow without me hearing it. I ran toward the groaning noise, and then I heard footsteps running fast behind me. I spun around to see Heinrich behind me. He looked horrified, but otherwise unharmed. I was perplexed. Then I realized that the groaning had stopped, and along with it, everything else had gone silent too. I realized then that I was in the part of the woods that was darker than the rest, the area my father had always told me never to go in. Heinrich startled me when he began to growl. He was staring at something in the distance, and then I saw movement, light brown like a deer but it looked wrong when it came into view. It was not a deer at all. It wasn't a cougar for that matter either. This was something I'd never seen or heard of before, something I never even imagined could exist. The creature was frail but large, with yellow eyes and that freaking face. A face that looked like a rat was placed in a grinder head first. It had massive fangs and matted wet fur. Whatever it was, it quickly noticed us. Heinrich had alerted it with his growling. The creature stood up on back legs and walked toward me, one slow but sure step at a time. I panicked, and then I remembered I had a 45. I hoped that it would scare it away or hurt it enough that I could get away in time. I aimed down the sights and then fired three times quickly. I know at least one of those hit because it screamed the most god-awful sound I'd ever heard. Imagine an entire building going up in flames with hundreds of people screaming inside. That's what it sounded like. I ran, choking on my own breath, barely managing to call for Heinrich to follow me. He did, and we booked it. I heard heavy footsteps and breathing behind me. I took my 45 again and glanced behind me to fire. This thing was too close, at least 15 feet away from me. I shot twice and ran harder, and another scream erupted behind me. And suddenly, I didn't hear any more footsteps. But I did hear something else, something that made me stop cold in my tracks. Gavin. Don't go too far, son. That sounded an awful lot like my grandfather's voice. I know I shouldn't have stopped then, but I couldn't control myself. I stopped dead in my tracks. That voice came again. Come back over this way. I don't want you to get hurt. I screamed and unloaded the rest of my rounds into the forest. I could not see where it was now but I fired hectically, with blatant disregard of everything around me. When the chamber remained empty, 
I ran. Heinrich stayed close to me. As soon as I opened the door back home, I slammed it, and I collapsed on the floor. Heinrich lay beside me, just as tired and traumatized. The hell are you doing, son? My dad demanded when he saw me. I couldn't speak, though. I could just look back at him. He saw in my face that I was scared. He asked me a million questions and asked if a cougar had tried to attack me. I looked at him, and the only thing I could stutter was, N not a cougar. He looked a bit confused. I took a deep breath and said, I, I don't think it was a cougar that got Grandpa. I told him my story, but I don't know if he believed me. I know what the heck I saw, and something makes me think my father does too, deep down. That was eight months ago. I sometimes hear my name being called from the woods. I dread seeing that thing again, but I feel as if it's waiting for me. That alone keeps me awake at night. The Bigfoot from Trevor L. This all started towards the end of spring in 2016. I was hunting in the woods one day. It was fairly quiet, and I didn't think much of it. After having bad luck with deer, I noticed some crawfish in the creek next to me. I bent down to try to pick one up. Suddenly, in the middle of the creek, there was this loud splash of a rock hitting the water. I jerked my head up and just stared at the water, afraid to move. I looked at the trees above, and I noticed that they were still, meaning the rock hadn't fallen. I immediately thought, Bigfoot, I've seen plenty of documentaries on Animal Planet to know about this creature and the rock throwing it supposedly does. For my own safety, I quickly moved away from the woods. This next experience came a few months later in the fall. At the time, I was a Boy Scout, and we were camping at Beaumont Scout Range. That night, we were doing a flag retirement ceremony. For those of you who don't know, a retirement ceremony means we burn the flags in a certain fashion, and for us it meant remaining silent for up to an hour. During this time, we began to hear the typical Missouri coyotes. There was apparently a pack south to our location. Then, in the middle of those calls, there was another call. Much louder, much deeper than the coyotes. I was shaken by it, but I didn't say anything, even though I know we all heard it. On another occasion a month later, we were camping at the same location. This time it was about three in the morning. I had awakened for an unknown reason and was trying to get back to sleep, when from the hills to the east of our tent, I heard a loud scream. Who would have been screaming that early in the morning? And what human can scream like that? I tried to ignore it, but it kept going, and my mind was reeling. Then from the west, something began responding to it with the same type of call. If I'd had my phone at the time, I would have gotten it out and began recording this sound. I eventually got back to sleep, doing my best to forget about it. Later on, I asked another camper about it, but he had apparently not heard anything. A couple of years passed, and it was soon the spring of 2018. I'd forgotten the previous experiences and had resumed hiking in the woods behind my house. It was always so peaceful there, and on this particular day, I had been bird watching. I was walking home quietly, maybe talking to myself about something stupid, when a small reddish-brown animal ran across the creek, back up onto the bank, and then out of sight. I didn't see it for very long, but in the short period of time that I did, it reminded me of one thing, an adolescent ape. A month later, I was a few hundred feet from where I saw this thing, when from the other side of a ridge, I heard a splashing in the creek. Something was running around in the water, and I could hear it getting closer. I was expecting a massive ape to run over the ridge. The thought of this freaked me out, but nothing ever showed up. It just stopped instead. 
I waited where I was standing for what felt like hours before hastily rushing to my home. I later read that some researchers believe that mother Bigfoots will drop their babies off at a location for periods at a time, sometimes days, while they go hunt. I believe that the areas behind my house are one of these nurseries, and that what I may have seen was a baby, and that maybe I was mock-charged by the parent. Of course, I'll never know. I'm going camping again this weekend, so maybe I'll experience some new activity. What I Didn't Know From Anonymous I have no idea what I found deep in those hillside woods. There was no precedence in my mind for the shape that presented itself in front of us that day. Well, 20 years ago, my life was fairly aimless. I was a year or so removed from high school and I was working at my family's business with the aim of eventually taking it over. Most of my friends had left our small town for college or greener pastures. So I, along with one of my few remaining friends, Jeff, would frequently spend our time enjoying some of the outdoor activities that our surroundings presented. Some days we fished, others we would swim or boat ride. When in season, we would hunt game, like white-tailed deer or the recently reintroduced elk species. We were riding in Jeff's Jeep, enjoying some off-roading on the logging trails that snaked their way through the surrounding mountains. It was about 9.30 in the evening, and the sun had just made its way beneath the horizon by the time we made it out onto the trails. Most of the paths we took were wide and flat, paved with gravel and bits of sandstone and coal that fell out of the big dump trucks as they went about their business hauling. The trail we had wandered onto was one that neither of us had ever encountered. It meandered its way around the back side of the mountain and had become little more than a dirt path that was only slightly wider than our vehicle. Tree branches stretched out like the twisted leprous arms of some forgotten beasts in the wild. That aside, we were enjoying ourselves and didn't pay these ominous signs any attention. About an hour had passed before we realized that we were well off the main trail and we needed to turn around to keep ourselves from not being able to get out. Jeff spotted a trail up ahead of us that went out and to the left that emptied into a large field of high weeds ringed by maples and oaks. This would be where we turned around and also where our perception of what was real in this world got turned on its head. As he slowed the jeep down and made the turn, the headlights swept out over the tops of the weed shafts and settled onto a large, dark silhouette. Jeff slammed his foot onto the brake pedal and sat motionless in his seat. So did I. We both stared out the windshield at a spot in front of the jeep where the lights settled, but our brains weren't making sense of what our vision was feeding it. Standing at a height of about eight to 10 feet tall, and about four to five feet wide was something that I hadn't seen up to that point in my life, something that I have not witnessed yet again. Where the light should have bounced off at different angles and shapes of the body in front of us, instead it seemed to soak into this shape. The black that made up the only discernible difference from the landscape around it was such an absence of any light that it honestly looked like it was drinking in the light. So instead of being able to see the shape illuminated by the lights, we could only see that it was there by looking at the trees and shrubs around it. Its shape was like that of a large man with a broad-rimmed hat and some kind of overcoat. The big hat shape that sat at the top of the shape in front of us sat on what could only be called a head with a slender neck that draped into lithe shoulders and down into arms that kind of disappeared into a borderless absence. There were no legs to speak of, nor were there any facial features. D do you see what I see? I managed to ask Jeff in a horribly shaky voice. He didn't reply, but instead threw the shifter into reverse and slammed the gas pedal against the floorboard. The back tires slung rock and dust alike into the air as we raced backward and away from this dark anomaly. 
The cloud enveloped the vehicle from behind and to the sides, blocking the creature from our view. Normal thought processes ceased to exist for the next few seconds, as we tried in vain to grapple with what we had just seen. We only stopped racing backward when his truck slammed into a small dogwood tree on the other side of the trail we had been on. This seemed to shake some of the fog from our brains, as Jeff then put the gear shift into first and sped back down the little trail with me screaming a string of curse words that I didn't even know I knew. As the tires finally met with asphalt further down the mountain, we looked at each other for the first time since seeing the hat man. Neither of us spoke, as we knew what the other was thinking from expression alone. He dropped me off at my place, and I stepped out of his vehicle not knowing what to say. I turned to look at him. We both simply nodded to each other. Sadly, we never got the chance to talk about it again. This must have bothered Jeff on a disastrous level, because only a few days after this, I got a call from his sister. Jeff had overdosed and died. Only over the past few years have I heard accounts of so-called hat men and watchers. Back then, I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at or what to call that thing. I did know it was there, though. I don't know if we just happened across something we weren't supposed to see or what the case may have been, but I've carried that night with me for the past 20 years. This is my first time trying to put it on paper, and if I had a moral to share with you, it would be just be careful out there. I was the hunted from America's Hottest Redneck. This took place in the woods of Kentucky in the fall of 2018. My grandmother had given me a hunting rifle for my 17th birthday, so I was excited for a hunting season. The disappointment came when I did not get paid enough to purchase a hunting license or tags. My grandmother and mother surprised me with all the things I would need to hunt that year, though. My grandmother owned 32 acres of land in southwest Kentucky, so I was planning on hunting for deer on her property. That was a decision that I regret terribly. I went to her house that day excited to get outside. I showered, ate breakfast, and went out to the stand. When I made it to the stand, I climbed up into it and loaded my rifle. I sat very still as I waited for a deer to show up. I remember feeling very drowsy. I must have fallen asleep because when I woke up, two hours had passed. I checked my phone and saw the time. 12 p.m. It was lunchtime. I started down the ladder of the stand when I noticed something moving behind it. It was a tall creature standing in the darkness of the woods. I couldn't make out many details, except that it stood nearly at the top of my eight-foot ladder stand. I heard a low growl emit from it when it noticed that I had seen it. One word came to my mind. Run. I jumped down the rest of the way to the ground, and I sprinted. Whatever that thing was jumped into the sunlight after me, and I finally got a good look at it. It looked like the biggest wolf I'd ever seen, but wolves don't stand on their hind legs. I fired at it with my 30 6 hunting rifle. I heard an immense yelp, but instead of it slowing down or stopping, it charged me even faster. I did not think I could make it to my grandmother's house. At one point, I swear I could feel it breathing on my neck. But I made it back to the house. I shut the door and locked it and reloaded the rifle. My grandmother smiled and asked if I got anything. After taking a deep breath, I simply told her I had spotted one, fired, and missed. Beware the woods of Kentucky. There are things that lurk in those woods that will kill you if they get a chance. I'm simply lucky that I made it out of there. I guess that massive wolf wasn't hungry enough, or it simply wanted me to leave its forest.
Demon Cat and the Haunted Church, Experience One, from Anonymous. It was Friday evening, and me and my two friends were riding around our town with a feeling of freedom, enjoying our temporary release from school. It was a nice evening that day, medium temperature with a cool breeze. My friends, Cheese and Cousin, I'll nickname them that, we were all at Cousin's house when we were getting pretty bored. We chatted for a while, debating about what we should do with our time. We eventually settled on going to our other friend's house, uninvited of course. But Cheese was courteous enough to call him up first. That friend, unlike usual, picked up, letting us know that he was busy with his girlfriend. We missed the guy, and we were beginning to get fed up with him always ditching us for his girl. I mean, heck, she could join us if she wanted to. So now that we had nothing to do, well, again, we rode off into the evening sunset, discussing girls and the typical teenage stuff. Cheese said, Well, if we ain't got nothing better to do, let's go take some pics of those creepy abandoned buildings behind the liquor store. I personally had no idea exactly where he was talking about, but Cousin did. We decided to go there, and I'd say I regretted that decision. We took a trail along a busy road called the Rail Trail. It used to be a railway line. The sun was beginning to set now, and the temperature was beginning to drop. I kept complaining, saying we should turn back and go home but Cheese and Cousin insisted we were close. After half an hour of a ride, we reached the nuclear power plant in a town south from us. After crossing a bridge, we made it to the liquor store they told me about. We rode our bikes to the parking lot out back and continued down some trails from there. By then, we were riding on a trail in the middle of the Pine Barrens. I forgot to mention we lived in New Jersey. It's the home of the Pine Barrens, Maybe the most mysterious and creepy dark woods in the state. Maybe even the country. As we traversed the dark path, the sunset had dissipated. All that was left was a gray, ominous gloom in the sky. We went past a building which I assumed was an abandoned junkyard, for there were lots of old trucks and containers around a warehouse. I consulted my friends, who told me this was not the place they were talking about. I thought to myself, who in the world would build anything so deep in the woods, especially these woods? We passed the building and automatically made a left, going around a few concrete barriers to keep cars from taking the dirt road. After a minute or two of pedaling down the trail, we made it to an open area. There were two buildings here, one massive warehouse, and a smaller brick building. We began to climb the little brick building for the warehouse was too large to climb up. My friends took pictures, and then we began to explore the large warehouse. We were disappointed to find only piles of garbage and graffiti, although some of the demonic writing on the floor and wall worried me. Our friend called right as we were ready to leave, and he told us to not go into his house. He thought we broke in like we always do. We laughed it off and hung up. We had no intentions of going to his place that night. That's when my friend's phone died. Mine hadn't been charged, nor had my cousin's been charged. My heart sank when I realized we'd made the poor choice to come out here with a bunch of dead cell phones. We thought we were screwed, but luckily, I had one final light source, a detachable tail light on my bike. It gave everything an ominous red glow, though, but hey, it was better than nothing. We continued down the trail with me in front, giving a little bit of light. This is when things started to head south. We began to hear noises in the brush of the woods to our right. We all jumped when we heard it feeling on edge. We panicked for a moment, but calmed down quickly, convincing ourselves it was just an animal. 
Just as the goosebumps began to fade, we heard another sound, one that was otherworldly. It was accompanied by more rustling and snapping from the same spot, and we were freaking out more than last time. We started pedaling our bikes like crazy. I had no idea what was out there, but between the red glow around us from my light and the sheer darkness just outside the light source, I was fearing for my life. What was out here with us? What would happen if it caught us? As my mind reeled from fear, I suddenly took a tree branch to the eye. My eye stung and began to water up. I had trouble seeing out of it immediately. We cut right and I had to go over a few dirt mounds. I fell as my friend Cheese literally rode his bike over me in a panic. I thought I was a goner, my eye burning and flowing with water, and now my body was bruised. My fear told me that the thing that was around us, it was hot on our trail. I had to get up. I had to manage to catch up with my friends. We passed the junkyard, and we were finally back onto a hard road. We thought we were safe. We continued riding, but my friend Cheese said in a worried voice, Guys, do you see that? It's about to cross. Me nor my cousin saw anything. That's when Cheese yelled and came to a stop. Cousin and I continued riding, though. We turned around and went back to Cheese, who sat on his bike scared and confused. He told us the thing crossed right in front of them, and then disappeared. He described it with a stutter, like a white cat-like animal of light. Me and Cousin were now as scared as he was. We thought he was seeing things. We continued on, even more creeped out. We finally came out of the parking lot of the liquor store, where we caught our breath. This didn't last long, though, because we really wanted to get out of there and go home. We continued down the rail trail. After ten minutes of riding, Cheese made the same yell and came to a halt again. Me and Cousin kept riding in fear of there actually being something this time. Cheese caught back up to us and described once again what he saw. I'd never had such chills. He said he saw a black object on all fours, crawling across the path, and just like the other being, it disappeared. We ended up reaching a convenience store, where we decided to catch our breaths again and warm up. Surely, by then, we were far away from whatever cheese had been seeing. I went to check my phone, but quickly remembered it was dead. I held down the power button to check. I stood in confusion as my phone that was dead half an hour ago was now at 48% battery. Had I misread it? I told my friends we were going and we went straight back to my friend's house. My legs burned from the long ride, probably about 8 miles riding in total, but the sweet relief of sitting down at my friend's couch, it made me feel so much better. We fooled around until I began to think about the warehouse. We'd been in such a panic that I didn't realize what I'd seen. In a large hole in the side of the building, there had been a shadow by my foot. There was nothing in front of me to cast that shadow. But the shape of it, as I recalled, that's what scared me. Because it looked like a cat. One with no eyes, no mouth, nothing. I swallowed hard trying to forget what I'd seen. The three of us agreed to never go back in those woods again, but this agreement would not last. Demon Cat and the Haunted Church Experience number two from Anonymous Not long after our previous experience at the warehouse, we were hanging out at Cousin's house when another friend of ours named Sink showed up. We told him our story, and instead of feeling creeped out like we had been, he seemed curious. Sounds spooky, dude. Let's go over to the graveyard through the woods and see what we can find there. I looked at him like he was crazy, but somehow, Cousin and Cheese were up for another nighttime adventure. 
Giving in to peer pressure, I joined them. I didn't have much else to do. Making things worse, my friend Sink brought a Ouija board with them. I didn't like this, but I didn't say anything. This time around, we all made sure our phones were charged. Then we headed out. We walked about five blocks to the path in the woods. We turned on the flashlights. It was about 10 o'clock then, and we were just about to walk through pitch black woods with only phones for light. It was this portion of the journey that I feared more than the actual graveyard. We walked in a square formation, me and Sink in the back. In our fear, we locked arms. It was weird as we were both guys, but without a word, we knew it made each other more comfortable. We soon saw lights approaching, and we finally exited the woods. I think we all sighed in relief then. The worst part was over, or so we thought. We had to walk a final five blocks to reach the graveyard. When we finally did, we turned the flashlights back on and entered the field of the dead. We walked down the paved path on what was the newer side of the graveyard. I told Sink to take out the Ouija board, but now he refused. This was scary enough for him. I smirked. We continued down the path, panning the graveyard with our lights, looking for anything. We made it to the opposite end of the graveyard. There was a church there, boarded up with no way of entry, and all the lights were off. Me and Cousin were looking at the headstones around the church. We found it rather interesting. Some of the gravestones dated all the way back to the 1700s. We then began to examine some of the gravestones at the front of the graveyard. I was confused as to why these particular gravestones were on the outside of the fence, as if they weren't actually part of the graveyard. But these seemed to be even older. We continued to explore when I was suddenly drawn to a spot on the other side of the fence. I went up to the fence, shining my light into the graveyard. Cousin did the exact same thing, without saying a word. I swear I saw something pass in front of the light, but I brushed it off. Eventually, we both walked away from the fence, not a word being said, but a bad feeling coming over the whole group. Sink began to panic. It was 11.16 at the time, and he realized then that he had to be home at 11.30. But we had a problem. Me, Cheese, and Cousin did not want to go. After a long discussion, we decided that me and Sink would walk the long way around the woods, while Cousin and Cheese stayed at the graveyard. We were about to split up, when we all froze. All at once, our gazes went to the church. Goosebumps covered my body. A chill flooded over me. Inside the abandoned church, a light had come on. When we all saw a shadow pass in front of the window, that was enough for us. I grabbed Sink and we ran. Not seconds later, we heard the screams of Cheese and Cousin from behind us, but we sprinted all the way home, not looking back. I couldn't believe we didn't learn our lesson last time not to go out into the Pine Barrens at night. Some weird crap happens out here. Demon felines, shadows possessing abandoned and completely sealed up churches. I don't recommend it for a night out. I saw something in the woods of New Jersey. From Sneeves, 0426. This encounter happened to my friends, Ted and Alex, and I, in a park between Central Jersey and North Jersey. I'm also of Native American descent, and I'm pretty sure that a few nights ago, my friends encountered something I believe to be a skinwalker. On the night in question, my friends and I were hanging around driving when one of them suggested we should go to the park. This sounded like a great idea, as the sun setting over the lake there is quite gorgeous. We got to the park at around 7.15. We made our way through the trail up to the lake. Now, Ted was really into the supernatural and paranormal, 
So as we were walking, he was talking about this. He said he hoped we encountered something at the park, as we were on native land after all. A few minutes later, Ted indicated that there was something ahead of us, and considering he had been talking about this stuff for so long, we assumed he was bluffing or trying to scare us. We didn't believe a word of it. Of course, we didn't see what he was pointing at. We continued walking when we made the unfortunate decision to begin talking about the skinwalker. Ye not Lucii. I winced when one of the other two said this, because you're not supposed to bring up the name of the skinwalker. Just speaking about it is said to bring one closer to you. As if on cue, we heard a sound behind us. I swallowed hard as the three of us turned and saw the most horrifying thing in our lives. Something tall, something skinny. It was moving very slowly towards us. The other two could not tell from this distance if it was another person or not, but I knew deep down. So as not to scare them, I told them that we should hurry and pick up the pace. We began to sprint down the trail, trying to lose the figure. When we turned around, it was still moving at the same pace. We thought we were safe then, so we began to slow down and walk. We were also close to a busy road with a bunch of cars roaring past. Being curious, I looked behind us again to see if the coast was clear now. Surely, at that rate, we must have lost him. I nearly had a heart attack, as now the figure was only a few yards away. It had stopped making any sound as it moved. I screamed, my friends and I bolting away as fast as we could. We needed to make it back to the car. Out of breath, we managed to make it back to the parking lot. The only car that was left was ours, and whatever that thing was, it was still following us, and it definitely was no person. We made it out okay, driving off, Scared, but alive. But we should have never spoken its name. A day later, I was walking my dogs around my house. I saw a cat come out of the forest and started walking towards me. I quickly retreated back inside. I'd been told stories of the skinwalker, and having been pursued by one the day before, I was not taking any chances. These creatures are said to change shape. A few hours later, I picked up my friend Ted. Originally, we were going to go back to my house and play some video games, but as soon as we got to my place, he said he felt awful, dreadful. We drove around a bit. I was hoping he'd feel a bit better, but as soon as we tried to go back to my place again, he'd feel worse. We didn't really get to hang out as planned. The other day, he ended up telling me that whatever he saw at the park he saw it again at my house, giving the same description as to its shape. Tall, skinny, faceless, the same thing we saw at that park. These encounters have since died down, but we've learned our lesson, a lesson you should know. Don't speak of the skinwalker, especially out in the woods, because the last thing you want is its attention. What Happened to Me at Mount Misery From Johnny Matt, 1986 This takes place more than a year ago, but I'll remember it like it was yesterday. I've always been a believer in the paranormal, but after experiencing this, I feel like it's opened me up more to the other side. It was 12 years ago in New Jersey, where I still live today. I was 20 years old at the time, and my mates and I had this tradition every other Monday of going to Pizza Hut, and then going in search of places that were featured in Weird New Jersey Magazine. We'd heard about this one place called Mount Misery, and we thought it was the perfect spot to go, as it wasn't too far from us. We eventually made our way out there and pulled onto the dirt road that goes through Mount Misery. Now here's where things start to get a little weird, for me at least. 
we saw what looked to be a religious retreat or church that was owned by the United Methodist Church. So we thought, oh great, this trip is going to be a bust. But we were wrong. Once you drive past that, it's nothing but woods. Creepy as hell woods. We came to a fork in the road and decided to go right. But by then, I was starting to think that this was lame. I was leaning against the door with my head resting on my hand. I closed my eyes out of boredom, and the next thing I knew, my body suddenly tensed up, and I got really warm. I started breathing heavily, and I started to feel aggressive and angry. Soon enough, it felt as if I didn't have control over my own body. My friend next to me asks if I'm okay. I look at him, and I fight back the urge to hurt him. Now my friends in the front are getting worried too. So the driver makes a U-turn to get out of here, and while he's making the turn, I begin to laugh, a deep, hearty, sinister laugh. My friends are freaking out, and I am too on the inside. It's like I can still see through my eyes, but something else entirely has control of my body. Just before we reach the highway, my body goes cool and limp. I'm breathing hard, and I sit back in my seat. As soon as I'm in control again, I look at my friends and I ask, what the heck just happened to me? It was the most terrifying thing that ever happened to me, and I'll never forget it. I'm still not sure what happened that night. I've been back to Mount Misery after this, but I've never had that experience occur again. For the final story, I'll be re-narrating a tale from 2016, titled Camping in the Pine Barrens, from GW. I spent most of my life hunting and in the outdoors, so I know the various sounds. I can tell the difference between a deer and a person walking around. I'm also kind of good at tracking and would track my friends while hunting for the fun of it. The one thing that I never expected was for myself to be tracked in the woods at night. This happened a year ago to the month while out camping with my grandfather in New Jersey. I had just graduated school and was leaving for boot camp soon, so my grandfather wanted to go on one last trip with me before I was gone. The beginning of the trip went smoothly, lots of hiking and fishing. We went to the last place we were going to camp, and already it was getting kind of eerie. There was almost no other people here, and we were as far as you could get in. We got everything set up, and we ate, so I decided that I might as well walk down to the wash house about a mile down from us. The park had signs up about bears, so I had my knife on me. With it being New Jersey and all, we have really strict gun laws. I got down there no problem, only saw one person, and they were getting ready to head out. I took a shower, and by the time that was over, it was already dark out. Almost 100 meters down the road, the atmosphere goes south fast. It went from bugs making noise to dead silence, something I'd never experienced in my time outdoors. You know that feeling almost like a sixth sense of knowing something isn't right? Well, those alarms were going off in my head. I slowed down my steps to reduce sound, and I began to listen. About 20 yards to my right, something was parallel to me walking. My first thought was possibly a bird hopping in the leaves, but every time I would stop, so would this silhouette. Listening closely, I could hear it better. I could get a better idea of it. I could tell it was large enough to snap branches, and also that it was bipedal. I was carrying a large hunting knife as my only protection, but I knew that it wouldn't do much if something like that was to jump out at me. I couldn't run no matter how much I wanted to, because I knew that it would catch me. The only bet I had was to keep the same pace and keep going, ready to fight or run. I walked the entire way back like this. I couldn't tell anyone because who would believe me? 
I barely slept that night, expecting to hear it come closer and to see it in person. I've only told this story to a couple of close friends of mine, and they know that I wouldn't make it up. Now I want to go back there, to see if it'll come back, to see if I can actually see it. Stalked in the Swamp from Zachary L. I've always loved being outdoors and being in the wilderness, but I'm a bit new to being a hunter. This particular encounter happened during late deer season, so around late December. The reason I got into hunting recently was because of my dad. He really wanted me to get into it. He thought bagging my own deer was a great rite of passage for a young man. Plus, I've been curious about it for a while. He talked with a friend of his who had a reasonable amount of land. He got permission for me to hunt on his land. We spent the next few days scouting the land, finding hotspots of animal activity, making sure we had the best spots for where we'd like to hunt. We found a few places and set up some tree stands, blinds, the whole nine yards. One of those spots was a blind all the way at the end of his property in the swamp. The only problem is, during that time while we were surveilling the area, we would come across large dog-like footprints and would get the occasional flash of something running on four legs away from us when one of us would step on a twig or branch. So, one night, I decided I would get up early and go ahead to the blind. I woke up at around 2 a.m. and made the drive there. I arrived by 3 a.m. by myself. My dad had to work the next day. I made it out there, got my gear ready, and sprayed some no-scent smell on me, along with some deer urine on my drag, so I smelt like a deer coming through. I was armed with a Mossberg 500 and a small headlamp. Now that I was prepared, I headed out into the forest. Now, I don't know about y'all, but there's something spooky about walking in the woods in complete darkness, especially alone. I was slowly making my way to the blind. I must have been a hundred yards out, give or take. That's when I began to hear this howl so I stopped for a moment, and I began to listen. The sound sent chills down my spine, made me feel helpless. It was a chilling reminder that I was out here in the swamp alone. Then the darkness felt even darker. I put my shotgun off of safety, and I sat there for a while. All of a sudden, I hear something running quickly, so I turned my headlamp on and aimed towards the sound. Immediately, the sound stops. I could barely see something, just as it began to run off. It appeared to be some sort of large canine. I swallow hard, and I wait a few more minutes. Then I begin to walk to the blind once more. Soon enough, I make it there. I sit down inside the blind taking off my drag and zipping up the blind from the inside. A few minutes later, I hear something scratching at the door of my blind. This startles me, so I look over. I'm horrified. Whatever's outside is pressing its entire body and face into the blind. It's no longer scratching at it, so much as it is desperately trying to chew its way through, trying to get to me. I can hear growling and snarling, the gnashing of teeth. I literally jump up, grabbing my shotgun and pointing it at the door. I stopped and shouted, and then the thing ran away. I got a real good look at it too. I honestly thought it was a wolf, but it was just a coyote. The biggest freaking coyote I'd ever seen in my life. And despite its size, I could see its ribs quite well. The thing was starving. A chill went down my spine. That starving coyote was so desperate, it was hunting me. And coyotes, of all things, stay away from people. It took me a while to gather the courage to leave that blind. 
because as soon as I did, I knew that thing may be hunting me again. I reminded myself I had a shotgun, but what if it took me by surprise? I sighed, and then I left the blind, my ears on high alert. I kept the shotgun off of safety, and I held it at the ready, aiming as I looked around. My heart was pounding so hard that it was shaking the tips of my fingers, or maybe that was just panic. I walked as quickly as I could, while trying to also be quiet and steady with the gun. Thankfully, I managed to make it back to my vehicle without a problem. If I had to guess why it didn't come back, despite it being desperate, I think that coyote was battling with itself. On one hand, it was scared of me, but on the other hand, it was desperately hungry. And luckily for both of us, its ravenous appetite did not win out. Then again, was it really a coyote? Because I swear, it was larger than a wolf. The next time I go hunting out there, I'll keep an eye out for some especially hungry and large canines. Clemson County Creature from Lucian Wolfhart. My story begins on a cool autumn morning in mid-October in a small but quaint town near Clemson County where the Tugelo River stands. My friends, Al and Jay and I, went up to the mountainous region to enjoy a weekend full of camping. What we planned to do, aside from lodging and camping in a rustic cabin, was to hike the vast trails and rugged terrain and to hunt for our meals finishing the day off sleeping under the stars. This trip had been planned in advance, and as such, all of us thought we had everything covered, every contingency prepared for. But as we'd soon discover, we were horrifically wrong in that assumption. Our first morning in the mountains was met with a beautiful sunrise, the likes of which I doubt any of us had ever seen before. The light was warm and relaxing. Groggily, I got out of bed, still exhausted from the night before, as I was the one who drove for the last half of the trip. After waking up a little more, I got dressed, headed downstairs to meet the rest of my group, Ellen and Jay. As we gathered together and sat down for breakfast, we began to discuss the first thing we'd do today. Every so often, I'd tease them in hopes that one of them would drive next. But my attempts at persuasion failed, and I ended up being the driver for the day. We got ready and loaded into the vehicle, trekking into the wilderness for a day of hiking and hunting. I was up front driving and they were in the back seat. I decided to get back at them by swerving on a winding incline. I laughed, but someone slapped me in the back of the head. Come on, dude. Are you going to be that dumb through the whole trip? I chuckled. It was L. Ah, uh, calm down. I'm just horsing around. If I'm gonna drive, I wanna have some fun too. Whatever, Elle said. Just don't do that again. I nearly soiled myself. We eventually reached our destination. The fallen leaves decorated the forest floor, which crisply crunched underfoot as we made our way further into the hiking trail. It was really peaceful out here. Sometimes the wind would die down, and it would be nothing but silence and beauty, which would soon end when Jay began to whistle, usually take me home country roads. And being as catchy as it was, we couldn't resist the urge to sing along. The hunting part of our hike was obviously destined to fail. The day went by fast, and before we knew it, the moon began to rise, and with it came the nightlife. The moonlight was pale and eerie, creeping through the brambles and thickets of branches above us, sending chills down our backs as the air grew cold. Elle began to cling to Jay, obviously creeped out, saying, maybe we should get going, call it a night. Now, Elle's my best friend, and in the time we've known each other, whenever either of us gets a bad feeling, we'd take heed and turn away from the supposed risk. I nodded, and just as we began to head back in the direction of the car, a shrill cry rang out, 
a deafening and blood-chilling wail that snatched away whatever peace and tranquility was left in the night. We all stood frozen. The hell was that? Jay asked, L grabbing onto him tighter. Did you hear that? I began to scan the area around us, trying to make out anything in the dim moonlight. My ears twitched at every sound I heard, but I soon fixated on something in the distance. I squinted my eyes. It appeared to be two glowing, whitish yellow orbs. They were in a nearby tree. As quickly as I saw them, the orbs vanished, and that horrific wail resounded in the air, leaving us motionless from fear again. Courage or stupidity took hold of us, and we booked it back to the car. Whatever it was, running from it may be a bad idea, but staying there was certainly not an option. We made it back to the car, Jay and L getting in first. I jumped into the driver's seat and started it. As soon as the headlights flicked on, there in the brush in front of us, just barely visible, was a horrific visage. The creature I saw was sickly and had pale yellow eyes. I knew it knew we were scared, and it seemed to take pride in that. Its skin was a reddened color, like a tanned hide, only darker, while its face, from what little we could see, was sharp and angular. On the tree next to it lay one of its grotesque hands, just as monstrous as the rest of it, adorned with claws at the tips of its curled, elongated fingers. One leg was partially visible, and it was, much to our dismay, bent and misshapen. That's when we knew if this was a prank. It was the best darned prank ever, as no human leg is able to bend like that. Imagine how a dog's legs would be, or some other canine, with the knees bent backwards, heels resting off the ground. All the while, as the pads of its feet lay nestled on the forest floor, its sharp claws dug into the dirt and leaves beneath it. Then the creature cracked what appeared to be a smile, revealing rows of sharp and gnarled teeth and fangs. All of this, as drawn out as it seems, happened in the span of a minute or two. Just as quickly as we saw it, it slithered away back into the brush. What? What was that? I asked, fear stinging my throat and tears burning my eyes. L and J were yelling at me to drive. I snapped back into reality, throwing the car into reverse and turning around, gunning it down the path. To hell if the road was narrow. We were getting out of there as fast as we could. After what felt like an anxiety-ridden eternity, we finally arrived back at the cabin and slowly made our way inside. Not because we weren't in a hurry, but because we were shocked and exhausted. We all decided to sleep in the same room that night, huddled around one another, cold and pale as the grave. Elle was passed out from the excitement of it all, while Jay was soon to follow from a rundown of his adrenaline-driven high. But I myself stayed awake for a while longer, clutching a hunting knife and wondering if I should grab a gun instead. I tossed and turned, alert at every sound that came from the woods, unable to get any decent sleep for what seemed like hours, until I finally gave up on the idea of a well-rested night. Screw it. I gave a defeated sigh. I'm not going to sleep. I went downstairs for a drink and a bite to eat, still on edge as my heart pounded in my chest. There I sat in the kitchen, eating my midnight snack, drinking away whatever that thing was from my memory. All of a sudden, as if on a dreadful cue, a chill ran down my back. It was the same chill I felt right before that creature showed up, a feeling of a lurking nearby danger. A light tapping sounded at the window, and without thinking, I turned to look. In the darkness, two whitish-yellow eyes shone from outside, beaming into the cabin as whatever they belonged to searched around. Then they rose higher into the air, resting almost above the window frame. 
This creature was tall, frightfully so. It put its hand on the window, but in the moonlight it looked wet and redder than it did before. A fresh, viscous substance dripped from its claws. Slowly I backed away, and it neared closer and closer to the door. Seeing that the door was unlocked, I bolted for it and slammed up against it as it creaked, knocking whatever that hideous thing was away. I locked the door. I heard a slight grunt and what sounded like a growl, but then came a different sound, a familiar one. Let me in, Lucian. It was Elle's voice from behind the door. There's a monster out here. Please don't let it get me. Her voice deepened and became more sinister in tone. I stood there, knife in hand, tears welling in my eyes, a gasp in my throat. And then it spoke again. This time, it was Jay's voice. Let me in, little boy. Let me in. Let me in. It slammed against the door and let out its horrific wail, that ungodly scream. Jay and Dell ran downstairs, looking as shocked and horrified as I did. The voice demanded to be let in again, in Elle's voice now. Jay, open the door, please. That's not me in there with you. Then it spoke in my voice. I want to have some fun too. I think I may have hyperventilated, because everything went black after that. When I came to, it was morning. Jay and Del were standing over me. They'd already packed up, and we were all ready to get the hell out of there. We drove, and the mountains grew distant behind us, soon fading away as we made it home. This time around, I didn't mind being the driver this time. Elle and Jay refused to return there, but one day, I think I will. I think I'll go back to Clemson County. I love the woods and mountains. I love the nature itself. And I don't think the evil that lurks there can deter me. But I hope that when I do go back to Clemson County, it goes well for me. I'd rather come out of it alive again. Here's to hoping. Creature in Hangman's Field from DOC. My dad is a big hunter. My brother and I tag along on trips and trail surveys often. It's usually fun because we spend all day in the woods on our ATVs. One day we decided to stop and look at a spot deep in the woods. These were the Pine Barrens and it was already dark, so I was starting to get uncomfortable. This was a spot I was familiar with because we go through these trails a lot. It's called Hangman's Field because of a story of a man who hung himself on a tree here above an old well. The well is still there and gives off a terrifying vibe. But this area is one big scary trip. There's virtually no life, no signs of squirrels, deer, or plants, just dead vegetation and still air. There's a giant lonesome dead tree that is snapped in half and hangs unnaturally. My point is, the whole place isn't somewhere you want to go to feel good. We stopped and opened up the cooler to get a drink as my dad looked around, trying to get a signal on his cell phone so we could find our way back through the woods. Out of nowhere, we hear a loud and heavy animal running through the field. The noise was prominent, there were no other sources of sounds around us. This creature was circling us. We turned on all the headlights on the ATVs in an effort to see it or scare it off. And we did see it, and we knew then that trying to scare it off would be impossible. It was no less than seven feet tall, lumbering but quick. We could hear its breathing whenever it stopped running. This thing was a monster. It gave off a blood-curdling screech that made us cringe and shiver. It had skin like tree bark. 
with limbs that meandered like a dead tree. You would mistake it for a tree if you didn't know any better or if you didn't look close enough. But having seen it run and hear it screeching at us, we knew it was something otherworldly. We quickly decided to get the hell out of there and followed the trail all the way back until we hit the power lines, which meant we were close to the truck. We loaded the ATVs faster than ever and hopped in. We were familiar with stories about the Pine Barrens before this happened, but we never thought we'd see something like this. If you're ever out at Hangman's Field, it's too late and you've made a dire mistake. Something Below My Tree Stand From That Fat Canadian I'm a native Canadian living on 30 acres of land, owned by my dad. On our land, we have horses, sheep, cattle, and four husky Rottweiler mixes. Quite an intimidating breed of dog. Anyway, out here, I love hunting, and I've had my eye on this prime buck. 13 points, grayish-white pelt. I've caught him on my trail cam about 10 times now. He's had plenty of time to start a family so it's time for him to be claimed by me. One day I take one of the horses, Magic, looking for the trail of Frost, which is what I named the big buck. I tie him up at the start of the trail, and I make my way to my tree stand. According to the cameras, this was the most recent trail that he was on, and it happened to be the most common trail he was seen at. So I was feeling lucky. Sure enough, after waiting about two hours in my tree stand, I saw a huge buck in the nearby field, and I knew it was him. I take aim through the scope, careful about being quiet and precise. This may be my only chance. The huge buck and doe that's with him are both spooked and run into the tree line. I curse under my breath, then look back in the scope, searching for what may have done that. When suddenly, I hear a snap from a twig or branch below me. Instinctively, I look away from the scope and peer down, and I can't breathe. A few feet under me is the most bizarre-looking creature I'd ever seen. It had the face like a dog, but stood tall. I'd say six and a half to seven feet tall, to be exact. It was staring into the clearing where the deer just were. Obviously, I wasn't the only one hunting them. I realized then that this creature stank to high heaven. I also realized that I was downwind, and something that stank that bad would have quickly been noticed by those deer. I held my breath, and I waited ages for the thing to leave. I must have done a dang good job covering up my scent that morning, because it failed to notice me but I continued to hold my breath as long as possible. When I did breathe, I would do it slowly. If I'd have made a sound, I don't think I'd be alive today. I thought about shooting it, but I wasn't sure how many bullets would do the trick, and reloading this thing would take too long. After about 20 minutes, the thing finally started to move. Unluckily for me, it was moving in the direction where I'd left my horse. I slowly climbed down when the coast was clear, and I prayed that it didn't hurt magic. The walk back to magic was the longest walk of my life, both because I was terrified and because I was walking at about two miles per hour, if not slower. As soon as the smell of the thing began to dissipate, I began to smile. I walked faster until I began to run, and I climbed aboard Magic, who was perfectly fine, thank God. Then the two of us got out of there. After seeing this creature, it didn't stop me from hunting there, but it definitely made me more cautious. There's no telling what it was, but if it comes close to my house and threatens Magic and the livestock, I'm ready to face off with it. Treasure Hunting Turned Nightmare From Aaron By the way, this is a different kind of hunting story, but I hope you like it. 
I woke up one Saturday morning to my friend Jamie calling me, asking me if I wanted to go on a treasure hunt with his metal detector in the woods. I agreed, because it sounded interesting, and it was a warm sunny day in Warrington, England. At around 10.30, we met at our local subway in Stockton Heath to grab a sub before heading out to the forest. My friend Samuel looked on edge as we made it out there. He'd never really liked nature. The woods freaked him out for as long as I'd known him. I reminded him, as I always did, that there was nothing to be afraid of out here. But that day, it was about to be proved wrong. Jamie could not wait to use his metal detector, and as soon as he could, he had it out and was scanning the ground a little too quickly. I told him to slow down or it wasn't going to pick anything up, but he didn't listen. Jamie was the time to get very excitable. We must have spent several hours out here, but we didn't find anything. Jamie was entirely disappointed, and I had regretted saying yes to this, as I expected us to find something. Maybe an old broken pair of glasses at the very least, or an old coin. Even an empty can would have been fun, but we literally found nothing. Samuel, who had been ready to head back at the first minute, was getting excited himself because he knew it was time to go home. As we were walking back on the trail, we all froze for a moment, because, of all people, Samuel stopped us and pointed ahead on the trail. Guys, do you see that? His finger led to what appeared to be some bushes. See what, dude? Those. That. The big clump of stuff on the right side of the trail, he said. I don't see anything, man. It looks like some bushes to me. Yeah, Samuel said. But they weren't there before. That's what I'm saying. Man, you're just seeing things. I'm telling you, it's just... And then the bushes started to move. What appeared to be a thicket of leaves now looked to be hair curly and gross. This bush got taller until it stood about eight feet tall, and we realized that what we were looking at was not plants at all, but a large and mysterious hairy creature. It walked across the trail and disappeared on the other side, leaving us dumbfounded and horrified. As soon as its footsteps died down, we ran back home. After this experience, our little friend group has not gone back into those woods. And these days, I often take second glances at thickets and bushes, because apparently, sometimes they can be something else. Cabin in the Woods from XX Rowdy XX. This happened in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm a 31-year-old woman, and this happened in 2006. At the time, I must have been 17, going on 18. My boyfriend Mike, my friend Amy, and her boyfriend Nick are the ones involved in this unexplained event, including myself, of course. Now, there's this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods, you can only get to it by walking about a mile in one direction. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and other random vehicles like short school buses and such, just sitting there, and many of them are covered in bullet holes. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. Believe me, if there was, we wouldn't be walking a mile to get there. So we're not entirely sure how those abandoned vehicles and things got out there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previous to our encounter. It was creepy, but nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Nick. On our previous trip, we went with our friends T and J, playing a failed session of a Ouija board. Later on after this, my boyfriend and I were talking to Amy and Nick about the cabin, about what we saw when T and J came with us so we decided we were going to go later that day together. The day this encounter happened, 
The four of us went to the lake, packed a cooler with food, and spent probably five hours or so just hanging out at the lake. Once we left, we stopped at Amy and Nick's house, dropping the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour walk to the weird cabin. We had flashlights, and that was pretty much it. The walk there was uneventful, which I am now thankful for. We made our way through the two huge drainage tunnels before we made it to the cabin. It wasn't dark out just yet. That night when we saw the cabin again, something seemed different about it. It's hard to explain, but it was just different. Maybe it's because we came later last time, but I don't think that was it. When we get inside, Amy and I were going to go upstairs. I wanted to show her the weird socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock I broke last visit that I'd somehow heard ticking again when we were outside. As we start to go up the stairs, there's a sudden and loud crash, like something was thrown or knocked over. Amy freaks out, and then out of nowhere, she books it back outside and heads down to the creek yelling at Mike, Nick, and myself to follow her. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears having a full-blown panic attack. She was saying something, but I couldn't understand it. Finally, I can make out what she's saying as she calms down. She said she saw someone in the window looking at us, someone she didn't recognize. We tell the guys about this, and they look around for a while. But in the end... We seem to be alone. Nobody's here. Nobody's been here but us. Since she's feeling so upset, we decide to leave. As we're walking back down through the creek bed, heading back the same way we came, Mike and Nick are kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks or boulders standing right up in a line the entire way down the creek bed. They were not like this before. They couldn't have been set up like this anyway, as we just crossed through here a few minutes ago. And these are huge rocks. It'd take multiple people to even roll them or tip them over, let alone line them up. We were beginning to freak out, all of us. We picked up the pace and started to haul tail out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Well, we tried to but all four of our flashlights stopped working. None of them would turn on. They'd been working perfectly fine on the way there. So what was going on? Half an hour later, we make it back to my boyfriend's parents' house, where Amy and Nick's car is parked. Amy gets in her car, because at this point she's ready to go home, ready to forget this event even happened. The rest of us are still outside the car, then Amy suddenly gets out of the car screaming, jumping up and down and flailing about. She's covered in ants. We scramble over to her and look inside the car. They're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Nick opens the trunk of the car and lying in the trunk is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock and it's covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier. We'd been in and out of that trunk all day, storing and removing things, and there was nothing in that trunk when we left the house from dropping off the cooler. Now there was this freaking disgusting wool sock covered in ants. There were so many they were draped over the car inside and out. Needless to say, we've never headed back to that cabin, and I personally will never go back there. I would later learn that a man used to live at that cabin named Hubert, a man who had lusted for children. Think of all of this what you will, but I'll always remember the terror and confusion I felt that night. Camper Creature from Jacob R. My family and I go camping every year for Halloween, and every time we go to the same campground. 
This happened a few years ago in 2016. We had a brand new reflection camper that we'd gotten shortly after my 16th birthday. It was October 30th. We'd just gotten our designated camper lot and got set up. It was around 2 p.m. My parents decided to go get some food for the weekend and candy for the trick-or-treaters for tomorrow night. While they were gone, I took the time to go and ride my bike around the campground, maybe go do a little bit of fishing too. I was gone for maybe 30 minutes or so when I came back to the camper. Something seemed different. Something seemed wrong. When I left, the outdoors had been quite loud, but now it was eerily silent. The birds stopped chirping, and the wind slowed to a crawl. Even all the people that were outside before had all gone back into their campers. As I walked to the camper door, a bit confused, the entire camper began to shake violently. I could hear things getting thrown and broken inside. The next thing I hear, there's glass breaking and something falling out of the back of the camper. I quickly run around to the back, only to see the hind end of a pale grayish creature running into the woods on all fours. I saw just enough of its body, and it was horrifying. I think it even had some sort of horns or antlers. It was really skinny, so much so you could see the bones under its skin. Just before breaking into the tree line, it let out this shrill scream. My hands jumped to cover my ears, and I cringed. Soon, it was gone. I looked at the camper, and there were deep, long gashes in the metal sheeting of the camper, broken glass all over the ground. I went inside, and everything was destroyed. Little to say, we didn't stay there for the rest of the week. My completely outraged parents took the camper back to the dealership for repairs. Luckily, they didn't blame me, as the markings and damage done looked to be done by an animal. They thought it was a bear who had wandered in to get some food. At the worst, they blamed me for leaving the door open or something. But I know I didn't. Sure, it was an animal that got in. They're right about that. But it was an animal that could open doors like a person. Ugh, that thing's scream will haunt me till the day I die. Creature in the Adirondacks From Averopsis I bought this cabin last year, right before the company I worked for went belly up and I lost basically everything else. It was meant to be a fishing cabin, but losing my job forced me to leave the apartment in New York City that I could no longer afford, and the cabin became my new home. I took up some freelance writing to keep myself fed, and I fixed up the old Land Rover that the previous owners had left on the property for grocery runs. The cabin itself came fully furnished, with brand new appliances. It was lakefront property, a rarity in the Adirondack Park due to strict building requirements. It had a three-bedroom main floor and a basement accessible from outside of the house that doubled as a garage for the Land Rover and a laundry room. Following the advice of one of the locals, I bought a large freezer to store meat and vegetables through the winter. Roads leading into the remote town of Long Lake were treacherous during the winter months, and that made food scarce and expensive. I loved summer nights in the cabin. I'd relax by the water with a bottle of Merlot and a good buck, watching the sun set behind the mountains. Unlike the Big Apple, there were no street lights, screens, or billboards. The view of the Milky Way was the best I'd ever seen. Huge herds of deer would occasionally pass through, and I felt so much more in tune with myself than I ever did back in the city. I did notice some strange things happening. One morning, I went for a walk just before sunrise and found a deer carcass completely torn apart. It was clear that whatever had killed the poor thing had no intentions of eating it. Its head was tossed about 50 feet away from the body, its glassy eyes staring at its entrails strewn across the lower tree branches. Blood coated the leaves and tree trunks, and crows had already begun picking at it. After retching and heaving for several minutes, I called the park rangers out here to take a look. 
think it was a mountain lion? I asked. I did hear that the parks department released some to control the deer population. Not likely, the ranger responded. That's just a myth. We'll look into it and see if we can't track down what caused it. That was their canned response each time it happened, because it did happen again and again. Every other week, it seems like I found a new deer corpse decorating my property, inching closer and closer to my cabin each time. It seemed as though something was circling me, dominating this area, marking its territory. The deer carcasses weren't the only awful problems I encountered. Some nights, right before I'd drift off to sleep, I'd hear a sharp tapping on the front door. It was always several light taps on the door in quick succession. I'd get up to look out the peephole. I lived 20 minutes out of town on a poorly maintained dirt road, so it would have been odd to have a visitor so late at night. Right before I could look outside, the tapping would move again, often to my bedroom wall. Then it would move yet again. I could never pinpoint the source of the tapping, as it would move too quickly. I thought it was unlikely that a flock of woodpeckers would descend on my house this late at night just to bother me, but who knows what it really was. On those nights, I often sat in the living room with my shotgun until the noises stopped. One night, I decided to stay up and see if I could catch whatever was terrorizing me in action. I grabbed my gun, turned out all the lights, then I sat in front of the living room window, looking out on my land. Save for the garage light illuminating a small spot, it was totally dark outside. The first hour passed by quietly, watching the moths desperately flutter around the only light. I could hear the dock bobbing in the water, rattling as it occasionally caught wake, but there were no crickets chirping or frogs singing. Right as I was about to head to bed, I saw something huge moving at the edge of the property. I sat bolt upright in my chair, clinging to my gun and waiting to see what it would do next. God, I wish I'd gone to bed. Wish I'd packed my bags the next day. There was a sudden spray of crimson. Another mutilated carcass, a rabbit this time, was thrown against the living room window, and a blood-curdling shriek tore through the night, as yet another desecrated rodent bounced off the window's glass. Though my hands were shaking violently, I pulled a single round from my pocket and loaded the gun. My assailant had not shown itself yet. I headed for the front door to take a shot at it, wherever I thought it was, because at least I might spook it. As I opened the door, the culprit stepped into the light, and my heart sank. Nothing about it was right. It was impossibly thin and partially decomposed. Rotting hide peeled away to expose patches of bleached bone. It stood seven feet tall, with wide-set yellow eyes and a skeletal face. It had jagged teeth and claws like knives, making it clear that, though it resembled a deer, it was not one. I didn't dare waste a second on thinking. Right away, I lifted the bump stock to my shoulder and fired. It missed but the creature backed away and made that ear-piercing shriek again. I heard it growl, making a sound like an out-of-tune radio station frequency. Then it vanished into the night. Good, I thought, locking every door and window behind me on the way back to bed. Now, it knows I'll defend myself. The game warden was at my door the next day angrily demanding to know why my property was decorated with the corpses of deer and rodents. I was still blinking sleep from my eyes, and I indicated to him that I had no idea what it was he was talking about. From what I remembered from the night before, that thing had only thrown rodents at me. But as I looked around at my property, I caught sight of at least ten deer strewn about like the first one I'd seen. It was all I could do not to vomit on the warden's boots. Eventually, he believed me when I told him I didn't do it. I told him about the creature I saw, saying it was likely a deer, but wrong. He dismissed that quickly, of course. He asked if I'd been getting enough sleep lately. 
then went on his way after assuring me that no such animal could exist. Definitely not in the Adirondacks. That night, I was cleaning my dishes for the evening when I heard the all too familiar tap, tap, tapping on the living room window. I quickly looked up to see the creature again, standing right in front of the window pane, staring me down with glowing yellow eyes. It raised a clawed hand and dragged his fingers down the glass, making a sharp screeching sound. I could see its heavy breathing condensed on the window in front of it. I scrambled for my shotgun, my machete, anything to protect myself, and then I realized I'd left the kitchen window open. Sobbing, I ducked into my bedroom and locked the door, before there was a loud crash as the beast ripped the window open. I moved my dresser in front of the door to form a barricade, a feeble attempt to save myself or prolong my suffering. I could hear its heavy breathing on the other side of the door, hear its low warbling growl, smell the stench of its rotting flesh. It rattled the doorknob, howled, and then left through the window. It took me several hours before I could bring myself to move. The creature had come close to killing me, and it simply stopped. I couldn't fathom why. Rather than wasting time on the details, I called a contractor to replace the window as quickly as possible. I offered a few hundred extra if they could fix it within the day, and I'd never seen a crew work quicker. That was two weeks ago. I saw it again earlier today. I caught a glimpse of it standing at the edge of my property just after sundown. I'm afraid soon one of us is going to end this. I went down a haunted road that I shouldn't have. From Rooster. This happened to me and a friend of mine named Anne. In 2017, I was an airborne school graduate. I had, however, broken my leg in the first week. After graduation, I was set up to go down the road to 75th RTB to start Ranger Assessment and Selection Program. But I could hardly walk the day after graduation, so I went to the Troop Medical Center, where they gave me a five-month profile to heal and left me stuck as a holdover. During the depressing time, I met a girl named Anne. She and I hit it off phenomenally. I spent almost every weekend in her apartment located in Auburn, Alabama. Now, I've visited many supposedly haunted places, and I've got a couple of stories about them. If there's an odd event, I like to do everything I can to explain it rationally first. I'll only consider it paranormal after exhausting every idea of what else it could be. I had told Anne a few of my stories, making her watch some movies that she'd never seen. Anne had grown up Pentecostal, so she was never allowed to watch non-Christian shows, movies, and she couldn't listen to anything but country or Christian. She knew I loved to visit rumored haunted locations, so she told me about her own experience on Smedley Road. The story of Smedley Road sounded like a very typical small-town ghost story. Rumors of witches living in the woods, among other things. There's also a story of a family who died in the late 1800s from tuberculosis or some other rampant disease. The whole family had perished and were said to be buried in a small cemetery down the lonely, seldom-used road. Each member was laid to rest in this cemetery except for one. A man and his wife with their son had been buried together, but some tragic mistake had left their young daughter to be buried elsewhere. The story goes that if you can find this cemetery on a long, narrow, overgrown, and unmarked road, and you park your vehicle and turn it off, the family of the lost child will return to search for her and will not let you go before they have finished the search. Then you should be able to start your car and leave. Of course, this piqued my interest. I've never experienced such a phenomenon. Now, this was the story that Anne told me. 
I texted her to have her tell me again so I could be more accurate. Here's her story from her point of view. When we were in high school, my cousin Janet and I wanted to go down this haunted road, so we called up some friends, Jack, Trin, and Steve, to see if they wanted to take us. We knew that Jack knew the way. They agreed, bringing Janet and her boyfriend, Fred. We met and left from Jack's house in Jack's old single-cab Ford truck. Jack, Trin, and Steve were in the front seats of the truck, while me, Janet, and Fred were in the bed. When we started down the actual road, I kept seeing red lights following us through the trees. All of a sudden, Fred yelled out, What the hell? And we both looked to the other side where he was. There they were, matching our speed deep in the woods, more red lights. After they disappeared behind a group of trees, we didn't see them again. It was then that we pulled up to the cemetery and got out. We walked around a bit, but got a really bad, creepy feeling, so we began to leave. Once we loaded back into the truck, the dang thing wouldn't start. Jack kept trying and trying the engine, but it wasn't turning over. After what seemed like an hour, but was only maybe five minutes, the truck roared back to life and we pulled out of there so fast, I thought we were going to lose the tires. That was Anne's story. After hearing that, how could I resist going there myself? After much persuasion, she agreed to show me the way. The following day, we left at about 1 p.m. I wanted to get a good idea of the route and see it in the day. The road was indeed hard to find, and the cemetery was small and full of old beer cans from, I'm guessing, the 70s. Those beefy pull-tab cans. There were two sections, one lower than the other towards the back wood line. As soon as I walked down and stepped foot on the lower plane, a feeling of dread swept over me. All these graves here had been desecrated, brass nameplates ripped from tombstones, and the others pushed over or broken. There were graves that looked like they had been dug out, too. Before you say that the casket may have collapsed and that caused it, that's not what these were. In fact, in some of these holes that were dug out at the graves, the casket was completely removed. The partially filled in holes now full of weeds and overgrown grass. Anne was waiting in the car. She refused to step foot into that cemetery. I figured that the place was like many others and rumors were just rumors. I doubted that anything paranormal would happen. Maybe Jack and Steve had messed with the whole group years ago. But I would soon be proved wrong about this theory. We would later come back at around 3 a.m. The road was pitch black then. Even the LED lights I'd recently installed in her car on Bright could only cut about 10 feet into the darkness. The road was full of sharp and sudden turns, so I had to go extra slow. It was creepy. Nothing looked the same in the dark as it did in the day. We would have driven past it if Anne didn't jerk up and grab my arm to tell me to stop. She had gotten a bad feeling in her gut when we were near, and sure enough, we stopped at the right location, based entirely on her gut instinct. We got out and used our phone's flashlights to look around. The air felt noticeably cooler here. Before we even drove over... It was a hot and humid Alabama night, but it was completely different here. I lit a cigarette and started to walk when Anne called me back and asked for one herself. Anne had never smoked before, and she took it with shaking hands leaning out the window. I lit the cigarette hesitantly. She was trembling so bad, but I felt fine at the time. I didn't have any dreadful feelings yet. I walked around a bit at the upper part, still no indication of anything even slightly paranormal. I walked towards the back and walked down the slope. Almost immediately, an overwhelming tidal wave of dread hit me. I felt as if I was being watched, like someone was shooting daggers into my back, like I was being stalked by a mountain lion. It was an uncomfortable feeling, immersed in more uncomfortable silence. 
There were no animals or insects making noise anymore. It was deafening in its silence, and I was trying my best to remain calm, while every instinct in me was telling me to run. Then I heard the snapping of twigs nearby and the crunching of leaves. I was thinking it was a deer, but I couldn't see it. It sounded like it was only a few feet in front of me in the woods. I shined my light around, and I spotted a weird shadow. It was almost like someone peeking out from behind a large tree trunk. I could make out half a head, half a torso, a shoulder, and an arm. Maybe it was just my light casting a weird shadow from some leaves or a bush or something, I told myself. It was then that Anne yelled at me, saying it was time to leave. I could hear the terror and urgency in her voice. I took one last look at this shadow, saw it dart behind the tree line. I wasn't moving the light at all when that happened. I got the heck out of Dodge and took off sprinting, scrambling, tripping, all the briar and dewberry catching my pant legs as I ran blindly back towards Anne. When I fell into one of those dugout graves, I nearly broke my ankle. I picked myself up and got up the hill. This time, the bad feeling did not leave me as it had earlier. I jammed the keys in the ignition, and I tried to start it. But just like in Anne's story, it only clicked. It was like the battery had decided to die right then and there. I assumed in my panic that Anne had simply left the interior lights on, causing the battery to go dead. I was about to open the door to go check the battery connection when Anne grabbed the key, turned it, and it started right up. In that moment, her face was lit by moonlight, and I could make out tears streaming down her face. I squeezed her hand tightly and tried to reassure her. I put it in drive and turned left as sharp as I could. I had to do a three-point turnaround because of how narrow the road was. When I put it in reverse and backed up to the edge of the cemetery, I could see it in the red hue of the taillights. A pitch black torso and head inches from the car. But it didn't have any features to it. It was featureless and solid black, despite being lit point blank. I went from zero to sixty in seconds, driving dangerously fast with very poor visibility. Every so often, I could see him in the woods on the edge of the road between trees or random patches of tall grass, and especially so when I would slow for a sharp turn. He would be illuminated again in our taillights a few feet behind us in the middle of the road. Anne didn't see him, because she had her face buried in my arm sobbing. She then jerked up and asked me a question that I wished she hadn't. Do you hear that? I shook my head. I truly didn't hear anything but rocks crunching under the tires and my own heart beating. She physically pulled me over into her lap, causing me to hit the brakes. She pulled my head almost out the window when I finally heard it, the sound of a woman wailing and screaming deep into the woods. My eyes lit up with fear, and I asked her what the heck that was. I quickly got seated again, and I could now hear it from my side of the car. I pushed the pedal as far as it would go to the floor. Periodically, I would see the shadowy man. I could constantly hear the screaming even miles down the road. As soon as the car touched the dirt road that adjoined Smedley and led to Hardball, everything just stopped. The screaming, the shadow, the horrible feeling and terror... We drove back to her apartment in silence that was only broken by muffled sobs coming from my tear-soaked arm. Later, we talked about what happened, and she told me that when I was down by the back of the cemetery, she couldn't see me or my light, but she could hear tapping on the rear window glass like a cold and bony finger. The tapping moved to the back driver's side door and then to my door, like someone was tapping the car as they walked around it. That's why she was yelling at me to come back. It didn't stop until I got up the slope and almost to the car. That night, she shook me awake because she had a nightmare about a large menacing shadow man walking up behind me in the woods. 
I told her about the stalking shadow man that I saw that night. I hadn't told her about him, because I didn't want to freak her out more. I guess he basically told her for me. I'll never go to Smedley Road again. I know that Shadow Man has not forgotten me. He reminds me of his existence in these occasional terrifying dreams I have of him stalking Anne. I think he let us leave that road once, but I don't think he'd let us leave a second time. Horrifying Camping Experience from Stromskirt. This happened to my cousins and I around a decade ago. I was 16, and my cousins Bill and Ramon were 13 and 10, respectively. We had gone on a camping trip with their dad, who I'll refer to as Roger, to the Appalachian Trails and engaged in your average camping activities, like fishing hiking, and sitting around campfires telling scary stories before turning in for the night. We had initially planned to stay out for longer than a week, which in the beginning was a very pleasant experience, marked by warm, sunny weather and breezy, starlit summer nights. However, around the fourth day, things began to take a turn for the strange and downright terrifying. It was in the evening, and we were sitting around the campfire, talking and laughing loudly, your typical tumultuous adolescence. We roasted marshmallows while Roger was making dinner, when I decided to get a picture of myself standing in front of the dark woods, holding a large brook trout that I had caught earlier that day. Around 11 p.m., the radio that had been playing suddenly began to falter into static, causing Bill to smack it repeatedly in a misguided attempt to get it back to work which it didn't. An eerie silence overtook the campsite, only occasionally broken by the periodic crackling of the fire. Even the nocturnal choir of frogs and crickets had been completely extinguished, along with our own racket. I remember the tense feeling of being watched, as shivers ran down my arms and spine. Ramon, being the youngest, held on to his father who tried to break the unsettling silence with an inappropriately cheerful, let's eat. We turned in soon after eating, though it was distinctly hard to fall asleep with that deafening silence and the persistent feeling of being watched still hanging over me. The following day started off well enough. Birds were chirping and the fresh morning breeze was gently swaying the leaves around us. We had some breakfast, then headed out for our planned hike. I was feeling much better than the night before, and had begun looking forward to our woodland adventure. It was late in the afternoon when we finally stopped to eat lunch in a clearing, surrounded by forest and its noises. As we ate, though, I felt goosebumps along my back and arms, just like the previous night. The feeling of being watched returned. From the looks of it, Roger and my cousins were also overcome with an uneasy feeling. As if synchronized with our discomfort, the birds also halted their singing as silence befell our hike. Tense and tired, we decided to make our way back. The entire time, the dreadful feeling of being observed only grew as we approached the lake. Making our way down the hiking path and reaching the bank of the lake, we stopped when we heard a rustling sound in the distance. Roger held his hand up as if to motion us to stop. We went quiet while he nervously scanned the vicinity. Again, we heard a rustle, only this time much more vigorous and seemingly closer, as if something were stalking us from within the tall grass nearby. Roger, who was holding a rifle, was on full alert, as he was expecting a black bear. I think all of us were. His stance and seriousness frightened me, as my cousins and I huddled together near Roger. We stood there for what seemed like an eternity, until finally, Roger decided the coast was clear. We spent yet another restless night, haunted 
by the strange silence. The following day, however, was the most fun I had the whole trip. In the morning, we had gone fishing out on the lake, and I caught another large fish. After that, we spent the day swimming until late in the afternoon. We arrived back at the campsite around dusk, as I specifically remember the dramatic hues of orange and yellow that painted the sky in resplendent watercolor. Crickets and frogs were resonating their characteristic serenades as we approached, coming back from a day of fishing and swimming. We were laughing, stumbling along as we carried our fishing gear down the trail. Roger led the way. Before we stepped into the campsite, Roger stopped dead in his tracks, causing me and my cousins to crash into him and each other. Though he, a gargantuan man, didn't even seem to flinch, we looked at each other, baffled, and then we peeked down from behind him to find something which caused my legs to tremble in fear. There, right in the very center of our campsite, erected over the ashes of our long extinguished campfire, was what I could only describe as a grotesque effigy, apparently made of thousands of small twigs that had been banded together to form a torso and four limbs. At the end of both arms, twisted branches had been contrived into hands, and perched atop the torso was a large deer skull, which was seemingly smeared or painted with strange crimson-colored symbols. From its large, menacing antlers hung several small wooden trinkets, fashioned into symbols which looked like the ones painted on the skull. After taking in the disturbing situation, Roger snapped into action and gripped his rifle, which had been slung over his shoulder. He looked like a drill sergeant. He ordered Bill and I to pack up as much as we could, as fast as we could, while he started the truck, instructing us to leave anything too heavy including the tents. I'd never moved so fast in my life. We left nearly everything non-essential as we haphazardly threw our belongings into the truck. Meanwhile, Roger was standing watch, gun ready, as Ramon was crying in the car. Shortly after, we sped away down the dirt path, surrounded by these soundless woods. A few days after this, Long after we made it home, I had remembered about that photo I took with the brook I caught fishing. I wish I had never remembered about that photo. After downloading the pictures from my digital camera, I found the photo I was looking for. There I was, cheerfully holding my catch, illuminated by the warm light from the campfire. But something behind me had caught my eye, something I had missed while looking into the camera screen. Hidden in the gloom of the dark forest was a faint glimpse of a partially illuminated head. After increasing the brightness of the image, I almost fell backwards in pure terror. Right there, looking at me, was what appeared to be a menacing human-like face, with ghastly white skin, dark sunken eyes, a flared nose, and I swear I could see antlers above it. If the effigy at the camp was the second most horrifying thing I'd ever seen, this photo was the first. Bottomless Lake, Beware, from Stephen B. I recently traveled to New Mexico State Park, Bottomless Lake. I live about an hour and a half away, so traveling wouldn't be a worry. My aunt and siblings even tagged along. Usually, I'm down for any type of vacation getaway, but that day, my gut thought otherwise. Instead of following my intuition, I swallowed down my fear and went on. My cousin had tried to scare me a few times, saying there were monsters or currents would drag me away in the water, but I paid him no mind, but maybe I should have. When we arrived, it hadn't been as hot as I thought it would be. We set everything up and I went to the bathroom to change clothes. Right after that, I went swimming. I dived right in with my goggles on. I saw tons of tiny fish under two inches in length under the water, but nothing really bigger than that. 
We were in the water for a few hours. Then, about an hour before we left, I suddenly felt something brush against my leg. Having my goggles on still, I looked under the water to take a look. Only, I wish I hadn't. Whatever it was, it was about four feet long, and it was swimming past me. It was green, with eyes the size of baseballs. And it wasn't a fish, per se, because it had arms and legs. Its limbs were webbed, and it was slimy looking. It had spikes on its back, and when I looked under the water, it looked back at me, then swam away more like a crocodile than a fish. In a flash, it slapped its tail against my leg and was gone, leaving nothing more than a trail of rippled water. I jumped out of the water and swam to shore in a hurry. I'm too scared to ever go back in the water because that thing was the creepiest thing I'd ever seen. I think something's wrong with the cat outside. From Dang Dahmer 213. My boyfriend, his father, and I, along with our cats and dogs, live all cramped together in a small trailer in the middle of a Washington state forest due to some complicated and bogus circumstances. We're pretty much homeless out there in the middle of the woods and doing the best we can. My boyfriend's dad is a truck driver and normally leaves around one in the morning and isn't back until five or six in the evening, sometimes later if it's a slow day. His dad's pickup truck was out of gas, so it was just sitting there at the front of the trailer, still hooked up to it. My boyfriend had his car, but it was not in the best condition, and the brakes were just shot, but it got us from A to B so far. With the truck out of gas, my boyfriend's dad had been using his car to get to and from work, so from 1 to 5 or 6 p.m., we were alone at the campsite, depressingly sitting around watching old movies on a laptop or taking the dogs for walks around the park trails. Usually, we'd go pretty far in and go into some of the less traveled paths with the dogs. Things are kind of gloomy right now, and God knew we needed some sort of adventure during this whole time. What we ran into, though, was a lot more of an adventure than we had hoped for. We've been in this park for about two weeks now, and the first week went on pretty slowly. It wasn't all that bad, but it could get boring. We are further somewhat hidden behind some trees back in a community camping area. We've had a decent amount of people around us during our stay so far, but like I said, we were partially hidden. Now, my boyfriend and I have been spending part of our time over at our friend C Note's house. She's been letting us raid her fridge, use her shower, clothes washer, etc. We've been over pretty late a couple of times. And every time we do come home late, there's always this black cat sitting on the rock next to the fire pit. The first time this happened, my boyfriend freaked out, thinking somehow his cat had snuck out of the trailer. He tried walking up to it, but it would jump up and bolt into the woods. I could see the headlights of the car that when it jumped up, it almost doubled in size and just didn't look right. Like when it was sitting on top of the rock the way cats normally sit, everything was settled and it looked just like B, my boyfriend's actual cat. Once it got up, it appeared like its skin didn't fit on it and that its limbs were just too long to be an actual cat. I thought maybe it was a trick of the light somehow, and I tried to ignore it. We searched the entire forest for B, still thinking it was our boyfriend's cat who had escaped. Eventually, we went back to the trailer. Inside, Dad was peacefully snoring, and there B was, just sleeping peacefully. So the cat we saw definitely wasn't him. We assumed that someone else in the park simply had a cat that looked exactly like B, and that the oddities of the features of the cat that I'd seen was just a trick of the light. Before long, we went to bed. A few hours later, we woke up to the trailer rocking. 
Dad had already gone off to work. The rocking wasn't gentle because of a dog switching positions or something like that. Rather, it was rocking like something big had grabbed onto it and began to shake it back and forth as hard as it could. The air was filled with the smell of rotting flesh and sulfur, and the dogs and cats were going crazy outside. With how loud they were, I would have half expected someone to call a park ranger, but no one did. After what seemed like ages, the rocking finally stopped, and the smell faded away. It took a while for the animals to calm down, though, but even after they did, there was no more sleeping for the rest of the night. We were too terrified and confused. I've got no idea what's going on out here, but I think it has something to do with that weird black cat, non-cat thing. In the Darkness of the Forest, from Mike Wynn. For as long as I can remember, my dad has worked for the Forest Service here in Wyoming. He worked long hours, but always came home happy, even on the rare days when search and rescue operations added plenty of extra hours to his shift. Heck, maybe he was even happier after that, because my father felt like he was making a difference out there, bringing people back from the brink of death in the woods and keeping poachers at bay. One of my first memories is riding on one of the Forest Service ATVs during a family event the service was holding. But in 2008, my father came home acting different. And ever since that day, I never saw him smile again. No matter what happened in his personal life, the smile my father once had never returned. It was pretty devastating for my 12-year-old self. I grew up close to my dad, and now his smile could only be a vague memory for me. Nothing seemed to make him happy or interested anymore, not even me. In 2017, mom passed away due to breast cancer, and dad's demeanor only got worse. He stopped calling his kids, he stopped inviting us over, he stopped answering his door for anyone. Dad had become a shut-in, and I was terrified that he was going to do something that he wouldn't have a chance to regret. So the spring of this year, I decided to drop by for a surprise visit, and I was hoping to stay for a week at his place. After getting no answer when I knocked at his door, I began shouting for him, hoping that he'd recognize his own son's voice and finally come out of hiding. It worked, after no exaggeration here, 20 minutes. How I convinced myself to knock for that long is beyond me, but I love my dad that much. When he opened the door, he was disheveled with a beard that went down well below his collarbone. Considering dad had always had trouble growing out his facial hair, this was disheartening to see. He just wasn't taking care of himself. And when I went in to give him a hug, I nearly gagged at the strong scent of alcohol all over him. For a brief moment, I thought he would smile. But not even the sight of his son after all this time came close to evoking a real grin. We sat down in the den together as he lit up a cigar, an old habit he apparently revived. I tried not to grimace with disappointment and sadness at this. The two of us talked for an hour, going over how we've been, talking about how my brother had his third kid, which made him frown, because Dad still hadn't met that grandchild yet, but he knew it was his fault. After a long discussion, a moderate rain began to fall outside, and the sky grew dark. We sat in silent company together, listening to the droplets hit the window. The old CRT TV near muted, but a deep concern steadily swelled up within me, and I brought the question out into the open. Dad, 
The endearing word came out more like a desperate whimper in that quiet house. Mm, he responded, rocking in his chair. What? Well, what happened to you? I finally just said it. It felt both relieving and daunting. What do you mean? He turned away for a moment. I saw it back in you then, Dad. You came home from work that day. You never smiled again. Uh, well, son, your mom just left us, and... No, Dad, I'm not talking about mom. It was a long time before that. What happened to you back then? You came home with this look on your face. You were never the same. I stared him dead in the eye and I knew he knew exactly what I was talking about. Oh, he thought for a few seconds, then wiped at his right eye. There were tears in his eyes. Might do me some good to talk about it. <laughs> What's there to lose? <coughs> he laughed into a small coughing vet. Why didn't you just tell us back then? Because even I thought it was crazy, and I managed to convince myself that not talking about it meant it never happened. He cleared his throat, and he began the most wild story I'd ever heard. It was a Friday. I was tracking a bear. She was pregnant and feisty and was sighted too close to the southernmost campgrounds. After the fifth call-in from campers complaining and afraid, we put a tracker on her. Sure enough, her tracker stopped for a few days in the same spot in the middle of a dried-up creek bed, and the higher-ups sent me out there on the ATV to make sure she was okay. We wanted her to give birth just fine, but we had poachers out there, and I was honestly expecting the worst. The drive to the creek bed took maybe an hour. The terrain was rough down there, and the wind was picking up fierce. By the time I made it, I had already come up on some tracks and a few spatters of what appeared to be blood. I parked the ATV under a pine tree, then I took off with a rifle on foot. Before I came upon the creek bed, I could hear it. The pained moans carrying on the wind. Gruff and low, definitely a bear. I crouched low to the ground, didn't want to startle her. I made sure to turn off my walkie too, because if you piss off an angry mother bear, you're going to have a rough time. I poked my head through the brush and caught sight of her. There she was lying on her side in the creek bed. On occasion, she'd point her snout in the air, grunt long and slow. She was hurting really bad. That was the same sound I'd heard before, and there was no sign of the, uh, process being over. So I hunkered down by a tree and waited for a while. I figured I might see something rare. A bear giving birth. If anything... I'd wait and make sure everything came out okay. After a while, she grew quiet. Another half hour after that, I figured I'd been there long enough, and it was time to drive back and report in. I stopped dead in my tracks, though, the moment I got up. There are certain sounds you don't want to hear, especially in the middle of the woods. What I heard was a moist squelch and ripping sound. Made my heart freeze up solid. I, I turned and poked my face through the brush again. She wasn't moving. Her eyes were wide open, but her face was motionless and laid flat in the rocks. The bear was dead. But there was still something writhing around in her gut. 
something that had already halfway worked its way out of its mother's body. I felt sickened, but I was petrified at that spot. I couldn't move even if I wanted to. All I could do was watch, wait till my curiosity was satisfied. The newborn still on the inside pushed itself hard against the untorn remainder of its mother's stomach, and with another big rip, the flesh gave. Something pulsating and very much alive came crawling out with a gust of blood and uterine fluid. The creek bed weren't dry no more, but what I sat there staring at, this new life bounding into the world, was certainly not a bear, nor was it anything I'd ever seen or heard of before. It did have four legs, sure, but it was the only trait it shared with any other living thing on this planet. Its legs bent in awkward, rigid angles, each with a different number of joints. These legs met in the middle where there was an abdomen and what appeared to be a scissor-like mouth. From the look of its skin and the sound it made as it breathed, it was more like a reptile or insect fused into some ungodly aberration. It clicked with its upper and lower jaw, slamming shut and then opening. The thing was three feet tall, and looked like it would have barely fit in that thing's stomach. Dry as I might, though, I couldn't find any eyes on the thing. That was as much as I could take in, before it just scuttered away, moving in instant, juddering lines, like some fast bug on the ground. I must have stood there, staring at the creek bed for another five minutes, before I walked back to the ATV. Didn't know what to say to the rest of the crew, so I didn't say anything at all, save for the bear not making it and that some wild animals had dragged off the newborn by the time I got there. I looked at my dad, mouth wide open like my jaw had rusted and frozen that way. That was the last thing I'd ever expect to hear from him, of all people, and to be completely honest with you, I didn't believe a word of it. Even though my dad had never once told me a lie, this just didn't make any sense to me and broke my heart even more. <sighs> that wasn't the end of it, he sighed. We found a few more female bears in the same state, even some elk and moose, all of which had no newborn to be found. And before we knew it, we had a sudden rash of human disappearances on our hands. I was there for the brunt of it. It was the darkest time for all of us at the park. We never found a soul in that rash of missing people. And to be frank with you, nothing made sense to me anymore. Was my dad going crazy? Had he lost his mind after all these years and hardships? I didn't broach the subject again, and I soon left my father after a tight hug around 9 p.m. I'd been planning on staying, but something felt so wrong and dark in that house, around him. I was worried that my father... Well, he wasn't my father anymore. But if I was wrong and he was still the same man. That meant realizing that what he was talking about was true, and that was something I was unprepared to even attempt to understand. When the Wind Speaks Your Name From Draco Domination I live in Kansas, and I've noticed few people report the stories from here, so I'm going to talk about a legend I've been told my whole life, and what happened to me recently. The legend states if you can hear your name in the wind, or when the coyotes howl in the night, then something's out there looking for you. 
I've lived here my whole life, and I've been told this over the years. Starting back when I was young and about 10 years old, I would go camping. My uncles loved to camp and go super primitive, but we never went without a firearm. But now I know why. Skip to now, years after that first time he told the story. It was the 27th of April this year, and I went camping again. This time I was alone, and I was camping at a state park. I was only going to be out there for one night, so I didn't feel the need to bring a firearm. The day went fine. I tried to go fishing, but the cold water meant everything was dead, and I had no luck with the trout line. But maybe I'd be proved wrong overnight. Around 10.30 that night, I decided to let the fire go and crawl into my tent. But I was startled awake around 3.33 a.m. I rub my eyes and I listen. There's no sound at all anymore, except for the light, whirring sound of the wind. Not to mention the temperature had now dropped low enough that you could see your breath. I'm of North Germanic descent, so cold doesn't bug me too much. But this was different. This was almost like the cold was inside me, and I was about to sit up and check the fire and grab a drink. But before I could do that, I stopped, still lying on the ground. The sound of the wind had rushed by the tent, bringing with it a whisper. But not like a person or a mechanical recording, but more like white noise on a radio or TV. And then I heard footsteps... My only thought was why. Why now? Why here? As I was stealing myself to stand and face whatever was outside, I felt this unnatural calmness wash over me, and then I heard my name on the wind again. Whatever was out there, it was looking for me, calling out to me, but I stayed still and quiet. Sometime later, I was able to wake up again. I checked the time. It was 5 a.m., and the wind was now more like a gentle breeze. I wish I could tell you what was out there, but I even don't know that for sure. If I'd seen it, I don't think I'd be here now. If you're ever out camping alone, be sure to bring some serious protection, because you never know when it's going to be your day next. I woke up from Nile, 1888. Me and my closest friend group are avid campers and outdoorsmen. I grew up in the woods of Oklahoma and Arkansas. The woods and fields out here are my home, and I know it like the back of my hand. Excuse the cliche phrase. That's what makes this experience all the more terrifying for me because any person would assume that they are safest at home. This happened in 2004. My friends and I had gone camping in the Ozarks, like we had done a dozen times before. It would be me, Derek, David, and Isaiah, all guys I'd graduated high school with. That whole day we were hiking and going off-road on four-wheelers, and when we settled down for the night, we nestled a campsite into the flattest spot we could find in the woods. We roasted hot dogs and marshmallows. We weren't exactly hunters or fishermen, after all. Then, after talking about girls and our plans for the future, we settled into two different tents. I shared mine with Derek. Derek was a light sleeper. If you even had an inkling of a snore coming out of you, he would wake you up and tell you to go somewhere else. If a fly landed on Derek, he would be awake all night. Seemingly the only thing he could sleep through was nature. And as I was the only non-snorer between the other three of us, I was bunked with Derek across the campsite from the other two dudes. Anyway, we were exhausted after a long day, so Derek and I were quickly asleep without much of a conversation in bed. Now this is where the horror begins. I wake up an unknown amount of time later. My backside is completely sore, and when I rub my eyes and look around me, 
I'm horrified. I'm no longer in my tent. I'm in the middle of the woods, surrounded by miles of trees in every direction. This wakes me up quickly. I pull myself up from the ground, my back entirely sore from top to bottom. I look around, trying to make sure that I'm awake, and if I am awake, I need to find the campsite, my friends, as soon as possible. What the hell was going on? Immediately, I thought it was a prank. I know the guys have never done pranks like this before, nor could I even recall the last prank they pulled, because none of us were really pranksters. As I scanned my surroundings in the darkness, lit only by the moon through the pine needles in the trees above, I spotted a clue, one that only disturbed me more. I had had another theory that maybe I sleepwalked, but seeing this threw that idea entirely out the window. There on the ground in front of me was a long, stretching trail, like someone had dragged something along the way. In fact, that drag trail ended right below me. That was my trail. I began to turn in a circle, trying my darndest to see my back. I'd been sleeping in a shirt and shorts, as it was pretty cold out here. And upon feeling my back, I realized my entire backside was covered in dirt and mud. It was me that had been dragged through the woods. But by who? And why? How far away was I? Derek! I called out. If it truly was a prank, which I wasn't even sure it was that, Derek would be the weak link. If he even felt a bit guilty, I knew he would give in and probably come out of hiding. But after I waited several minutes, there was no reply. No footsteps, no sounds of hushed laughter. I was completely and utterly alone. I shuddered. Goosebumps raised up on my arms. I needed to get back, and I guess luckily for me, there was a path laid out before me. One that I was sure would get me back to where I'd been sleeping. I followed the drag trail in the dirt and mud, trying to push down those thoughts, the ones asking me what could have done this to me, or who. Then I started to wonder, how had I not awakened from being dragged through the woods? It would have been loud. It would have been wet and painful, obviously, given the sores and mud on my back. But I was unconscious until I woke up right in the middle of nowhere. I walked and walked on this trail. The woods were quiet for a long time. There was a steady breeze, and whenever it hit my wet back, it made me shiver. I wanted to be back in my tent. I knew then that if I made it back, and I couldn't convince the others to leave, I would just stay awake all night, watching the opening and hoping that I didn't fall asleep again. I was terrified of the thought that if I went unconscious once more, I would wake up out here, or I wouldn't wake up at all. And then with that thought, I was afraid that maybe my friends had been taken too. Having worried myself a good deal, I started to jog, and that jog turned into a run the more I panicked. I ran for as long as I could. I think it was maybe two and a half minutes straight or so. I slowed down to catch my breath, still walking pretty fast. I was huffing pretty loud too. You could almost hear an echo of my breathing out there. It was then that I felt a sudden and deep pain in my left shoulder, one that caused me to fall forward onto my knees. What the? Ah! The pain was like a shock throughout my entire skeleton. I turned around and saw a large rock, perhaps half the size of my skull, lying on the ground. It hadn't been there before. And as I was turned around looking at the ground, another largish rock came flying past my head. If that had hit me, I probably would have been killed. Now angry, I began to look around again, 
peering from tree to tree trying to find who was doing this to me, but I still didn't see so much as a figure. Hey, stop that. This isn't funny. I reprimanded whoever it was out there, but once more, there was no response. And then another rock came flying from a different direction, another rock that I barely dodged. I was being attacked and possibly trying to be killed. I started running again, even though I was still out of breath. This time I ran for nearly 12 minutes straight. I ran so long and so hard that my vision was getting darker and blurry. I was moments away from passing out if I didn't stop. But, as if by some miracle, when I did stop, I was just on the edge of my campsite. Judging by how far I ran and for how long I'd been walking and running, I'd been dragged a good two or three miles at least. That's a bit of a ways for something that I thought or hoped was just a prank. But after being attacked in the middle of the night in these woods, this was no prank. The rocks had stopped being thrown several minutes prior, I stepped calmly into the clearing where the campsite was. It was undisturbed, save for two things. The trail from my tent into the woods where I had been dragged, and my tent flap still being open. Slowly, I stepped towards my tent, worried that I wouldn't see Derek in there. But when I saw him asleep, still perfectly fine and perfectly out of it, I was even more terrified than I thought I would be. What in the entirety of the world could drag me out of the tent after unzipping it, keeping me asleep while being dragged through the dirt for miles, while not even waking Derek or any of the others for that matter? I mean, if my friend was being dragged away after someone broke into our tent, surely I would have noticed. I sat next to him, not even bothering to look at the other tent to make sure the other two were okay. I was just happy to be back, and I had a promise I had to keep for myself, that promise of sitting still, watching the tent opening, and hoping that I didn't fall asleep. Well, for the remainder of the night, I managed to stay awake. Funny thing is, pure primal fear is quite the motivator to keep your eyes peeled. When Derek began to stir, I asked him if he noticed anything weird going on last night, but he answered with, nah, man, I slept like a baby. About half an hour later, I heard the other two's tent unzip, meaning they also slept well and hadn't left their tent all night. So, I wasn't pranked. I don't have any answers, and that's what really keeps me awake when I think about this. Now I'm asking you, who or what could have done this to me? How can someone be dragged through the woods for miles without ever waking up? And who or what was it that threw those rocks at me? I don't know if I'll ever figure it out, but I do know I don't camp in the Ozarks anymore. That's sad for me because it makes me feel as if my home and my childhood has been stolen from me. Hiking Attack from Sierra M. I'm a girl who has been hiking my whole life. I'd always go hiking with my mom and dad when I was able. And since I've moved a few states away, I try to hike at least one weekend a month. There's some beautiful mountain trails near where I live, and they make for the perfect hiking place. I'll just say that I live in New England, so I'm quite used to it being very cold out when I go hiking. Now, what I never expected to happen to me on one of my hiking days was to have the most terrifying experience of my life just goes to show you that anything can happen in the woods if you're not careful. And even if you are careful and prepared, still, anything could happen. 
So I'd been hiking all day that day, it seemed. I was out at my usual mountain trail at around 2 o'clock p.m. I'd gotten off work at 12. We usually have half days on Saturday, and the forecast said it would be warmer than usual for the day. So I figured I'd get some hiking done before it gets dark, and so I did. Anyway, I'd been hiking for pretty much the whole day. No problems, nothing weird. I was circling the mountain trail a number of times, so I was never more than about an hour away from my car at the parking lot. So when I decided it was time to head back because the sun was going down, it would take me maybe an hour to get there, which I was all for. I was pretty hesitant to leave. I always thought if I could live out here, I would. As I was walking back, with the sky now turning that sort of orangish color, I swear I began to hear something strange. Now, it's quite normal to have someone walking ahead of you or behind you on these trails. They're open to the public, even though they're not used that often. The problem with this sound was, they may have been footsteps, but they sounded more of a clopping sound. A human foot usually sounds like a quick press with weight steadily applied down to it. But this stepping sound, it was just an instant clop, clop, clop. It was coming from several yards behind me. Now, I didn't want to be that awkward person who looked back just to make eye contact with someone who was minding their own business, but I couldn't help myself. I had my fingers on some pepper spray I had in my pocket, just in case, and I turned around slowly. I wasn't alone. No surprise. About 15 or 20 yards behind me on the trail, I noticed a masculine figure. We both stopped as I looked. I'm not sure why. This made it even more awkward for a moment. But just before I turned around to continue going, something turned that awkwardness into confusion, into terror. Because what I thought was a hat at first wasn't actually what was on the guy's head. I swear to God, it's going to sound insane, but when I looked atop his head, I saw horns. I kind of leaned to the side and to the other side, trying to make sure that it wasn't just a branch or brambles off the path behind him or in front of him, making it look like he had horns. But no, there were in fact some sort of growths coming out of his head. Whether they were real or not, I didn't care because if some dude in the middle of a trail, nearly at nighttime, was following a girl while wearing fake horns on his head, that's not a situation I'd ever want to be in, and the alternative would be worse. If they were real, what would that mean? I stayed motionless until this man or thing stepped and clopped forward again. Then clop, 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 he began to run right at me, I was so startled that I tripped at first when I began to run away. When I picked myself up and started to run full speed, I stupidly and without thinking ran right off the trail instead of bending with the turn of the trail. I don't know what I was thinking. I ran in the middle of the woods through dead leaves and an ocean of browned pine needles for as long as I could before I had to push my back up against a tree and hide. I didn't hear the clopping footsteps anymore. I wasn't sure how long I'd been running, but I did know that the orange sky was now a pink or purple hue. It was going to be dark very soon, and the temperature had already dropped a good 10 degrees. If I stayed out here too long, if I got lost, I would be in freezing temperatures for the night. While panting and trying my best to keep it quiet, I leaned out from behind the tree on either side, looking, searching for my attacker. I didn't see him or it. The footsteps still seemed gone. I may have lost him, but I would be in some serious trouble if I didn't leave these woods and get home. I had to find my way out, but I was too scared to head back the way I came. Thing is, I didn't even know which way I came at this point. I began to walk again, trying to keep my footsteps quiet, but the moment I left my hiding spot, 
I heard laughter. Laughter from behind the trees to the side of me. I jumped and turned toward them, but saw nothing. But then the laughter erupted from the opposite direction. I turned that way too, but again saw nothing. I was losing it. I shook my head quickly and reminded myself I had to get out of here. I began to power walk in the direction I thought the trail would be. I tried to keep my face forward. I was afraid I'd see something to my sides if I looked. I was obviously being toyed with by that thing I saw earlier, but unless it actually came up and hurt me, then I needed to ignore it. I needed to get away. My best bet would be driving out of here. If I made it to my car, everything would be okay. I'd been looking practically straight down for a while, tears welling up in my eyes because I couldn't believe the situation I was in. So when I nearly stepped on a big, hairy body lying face down on the ground, I nearly screamed. The body I was looking at now in front of me, it was the same shape as the man I'd seen on the trail, and it too had horns atop its head. I stayed still at first, observing the body, or maybe just too afraid to move. But then I saw the back of its chest rising and falling. It was breathing. Was I being toyed with again? I was so terrified of staying next to this thing that I ran around it and started to sprint again. I sprinted until my knees began to wobble. If I kept going like that, I'd fall flat on the ground myself. With all the adrenaline flowing through me, I didn't think as much about how nonsensical this situation was. I just kept walking, hearing the laughing again from time to time, and once more finding the same hairy face-down body breathing on the forest floor. Again, I ignored it and sprinted as fast as I could before it got up. I kept going for literally about an hour and a half before I finally broke through the trees. I never did find the trail again, but luckily what I stumbled upon was the actual parking lot. I know how many people stay lost in the woods, how many people are never found. That is exactly what I was thinking of when I emerged in the parking lot and realized how blessed I was. I ran for my car, though I nearly fell onto my knees because my legs were trembling so much. I got in my car and I started it. I looked in the tree line and I saw that hairy figure again, horns up in the air as usual. The two of us exchanged glances for a moment before I floated away and never returned to that trail. I've no idea what happened out there exactly. Who knows what that creature was, or if it was just some dude being extremely menacing. I know you can get all kinds of crazy costumes on the internet, but why me? Why would someone buy that scary, realistic suit and then come prank me in the middle of the woods? You'd have to be nothing less than psychotic to do that. I'm just gonna leave it at that, because... I'm honestly scared to say that some goat man demon chased me. Because if goat man demons exist, then I don't think I'd ever be able to sleep again. So, for me, to keep myself sane, this was just some insane person with a very realistic goat man suit. If you ever find yourself in the mountains in New England, don't go alone and always check who's following you if you hear footsteps behind you. Come Back Fast From Delilah Harpy Eagle Something very traumatic happened to me when I was young. You see, I only knew my father until the age of nine, and then without warning, I never saw him again. My dad was a very passionate camper and a hiker. Some men love to go hunting and fishing and will go out of their way to do so. My dad was that way with just camping and hiking. He liked to stay in shape. He liked to be in the middle of nature 
and he'd always wanted to take me out there when I was old enough, and my mom wouldn't argue with him. But as I recall, mom wanted me to be a bit bigger. She was always trying to protect me from seemingly nothing, but now I think I know why. And maybe it's not even the same reasons she had. Anyway, a few months after I turned nine, it was a weekend, and my dad had gone off to camp. I remember watching him pack his usual hiking stick, a fishing pole, sleeping bags, and his tent. I even remember asking if I could go. He said to me, only if your mom lets you. And of course, she said, not right now. But this time, she attributed it to me not cleaning my room like I was supposed to the previous day. It's kind of hard not to blame myself for not being able to go that time. But maybe I'm just putting too much weight on myself. Anyway... I gave him a hug and a kiss on the cheek and told him to come back fast, which had always been how I told him goodbye. I loved my dad. Honestly, it may sound bad, but as a kid, I was more excited to see my dad than my mom most of the time. Not to say that I didn't get excited when I saw my mom again, but it was different between me and my dad. Come back fast, I told him, and he replied, fast as I can. As he drove away, that was the last I ever saw him. He disappeared on the dirt road, taking his truck through the old trails of the woods that bordered our property. Those woods were hundreds of acres, which were bought by my dad's savings years back. Though they may have been vast woods, I never really considered them big. They were just home, too, to me, though I've never been in them. Whenever I thought of my dad being out there, it didn't feel like he was far away, it just felt like he was next door, in the woods. But I guess I never realized how big those woods are. My dad did not come back in the morning. Cell phones were in their early stages, and most people didn't have them at the time. My mom had no way of contacting him. So the best we could do the next day when he didn't come home was drive the car up and down the road, after alerting the local authorities. I wasn't worried yet. I was a dumb kid, I guess. All I knew was that I missed my dad, and he promised to come back fast. Another day passed, and dad still wasn't home. We never did find any trace of his campsite, or him, when we drove those trails and scoured the woods. I was always forced to stay in the car, while my mom, with someone of the family, like my uncle or aunt, would search through the woods. I think they only brought me because they hoped that maybe I could spot my dad if he walked along the trail or something. With every day that he didn't come back, I grew more and more sad. After another 40 or so days, even with the help of neighbors, distant family, the cops, and the forest service, they never found my dad. They don't know what happened to him. Nobody does, but it was time to pronounce him dead, and we soon had a very confusing, bodiless funeral for him. My mom was grief-stricken, and oddly enough, I didn't cry, but I don't think I understood. For the longest time, I figured he'd come out of those woods at any moment. It wasn't like my dad to stay gone, even if everyone said he was dead. For me, if I didn't see it with my own two eyes that he was dead, then he was alive out there, working on making his way back home. But that's not what happened. But I will say this. My dad did come back, in a way. Six years after that, I was 15 years old. We'd long moved past the incident, my mother had happily remarried, and the guy was pretty nice. We still lived on the same property, still owned those hundreds of acres of woods, though my mom had been looking to sell them since we didn't use them, which I hated the idea of. Those woods were my dad at this point, and I was not ready, even after all these years, to have them sold. I tried to explain this to my mom, saying, would you sell your wedding ring that dad got you? She said no, that she wanted to keep it as a memory, and I said yeah, and that's how I feel about those woods. But I don't think she understood, 
Or maybe I didn't. I mean, if you were setting on nearly a million dollars of property, you'd want to sell it too, I guess. This brings me to the more disturbing side of this story. I had nightly chores. Most kids do. Some kids take out the trash, some do the dishes, but it was up to me to go feed the horses and to make sure their water barrel was filled up. The horse pasture was off to the side of the house, and at the fence to the horse pasture, you would have the best view of the tree line to our woods. Every night as I would walk out there with pails of food for the horses, I would find myself not looking in front of me, but staring to the side, watching the trees, trying to make out that one familiar shape, my dad. I was always hoping he'd just come out of the woods, that he'd come home, that he'd tell me he was sorry he took so long. On that night in particular, I was doing the same, but I quickly reminded myself that things weren't going to go back, so I turned and faced ahead to see the horses excitedly waiting for me. I refilled their hanging buckets at the fence posts, they excitedly gnawed at their food. I turned around and walked a third of the way back when I couldn't stop myself from glancing at the tree line again. But this time, I froze in my tracks. There was, in fact, a familiar shape in the trees, a familiar beard, that familiar hat, those green eyes. That was my dad. I turned and faced him, but did not approach. Instead, I waited. This couldn't be real, right? This was impossible. But then I heard his voice calling me. Delilah. It was him. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I knew it was him. My body moved before I could will it to. I was running to my dad. The empty pails left far behind in the middle of the field. The closer I got to him, the more details I could make out. Details that I had longed to see for years. That old plaid long-sleeved shirt that he had left in, and the way his mustache and beard was arranged, I could tell he was smiling wide. He had missed me too. I ran forward. I was crying. But I stopped a good ways from him. Oddly enough, he wouldn't move from the tree line, but that wasn't what caused me to stop. You see, the dad I remembered had arms. The man standing before me nearly perfectly looked like my dad, except it looked as if this man's arms had been chewed off, gnawed away by some rabid animals. I remember stuttering. D dad What's wrong? His smile somehow widens, and then he speaks something else. This time it's not my name. And to the trees go. What? What was he talking about? And why was he speaking like that? He had never spoken like that before. Or maybe it's been so long that I forget. No, that's not right. He definitely didn't talk this way. Before I could properly react, he said it again. Into the trees. Go. This time he was more demanding. Though I didn't want to move, I knew something was wrong. This man was not my dad. Nor was he a man in the normal sense. I began to step away from him, and his smile quickly diminished. He looked angry. I'd never seen him angry like that. It was such a bizarre and disturbing thing to see that it made me want to throw up. Every step I took away from him, his face contorted into indignation. After a few more steps, I couldn't take it, and I ended up running away. I went and got my mom, and I told her she had to see this. I brought her back outside, but the man, my dad, was gone. I never did see anything like that in the tree line again. I guess I should be thankful. But instead, 
I feel a bit more traumatized than I ever had. I don't think I ever properly mourned my father, and so when I had this happen to me, it really messed me up. The moment I turned 18, I had already had a job and I moved out. I refused to visit my mother as long as she lived out there. She still does. And I refused to ever go back near those woods. My mom thinks I'm punishing her for something, but I'm not. I just haven't told her the reason I'm hiding from those woods. I'm too scared to go back. My Brother's Memory from Bernstein. When I was in the 12th grade, my little brother, who was five, went missing. Don't worry, he was since found, of course, but the circumstances surrounding his disappearance for that time are kind of odd. My brother and my cousin used to hang out together all the time, spending the night at each other's houses whenever they got the chance, and one weekend, my cousin's family was going to a state park to spend some time there, get some fresh air, let the kids play, all that jazz. My little brother went with them. Sometime in the afternoon, they lost track of him, and before we knew it, a search party was looking for my brother in the middle of the night. For an 18-year-old, I remember being extremely scared. I had always been kind of mean to my brother. He always annoyed me like little brothers do, and I didn't give him the time of day. But having him gone like that, it really put it into perspective that I was taking him for granted. I never felt so guilty before. Luckily for everyone, at around 8 a.m. one morning, an old lady stopped her car in the middle of the road by the state park, finding my brother on the side of the road, soaked from the rain, but altogether just fine. When we got him back and questioned him about what happened, we couldn't believe our ears, and you probably won't either. What he told us was this. He was playing next to the woods. He had managed to put quite a bit of distance between him and his cousin's family. He was alone, and when suddenly something he called the skin bird flew down and picked him up by the arms. He said it had sharp claws, but the creature did not use those claws on him. Instead, the talons simply wrapped around his arms, comfortably in fact. He said the bird flew him away to the top of a pine tree, where there lay a pine needle nest that he was able to sit in. Every time he tried to climb down, the creature would pull him back up, but would never attack him. He said he thought it was pretty cool at the time, and didn't feel scared. Eventually, the skin bird flew away, probably getting food. So my brother took the opportunity to climb down the tree, he was quite the avid climber back then. He nearly fulled, but he made it down okay, where he wandered out of the woods as it started to rain. This happened over the course of several hours, apparently. I didn't exactly believe his story. It was just extremely bizarre to me, but I was happy he was okay. I definitely treated him better for a long time. The funny thing is, his story hasn't changed in a single aspect, ever since he told it to us. He's 33 now, it's been a very long time, and he still claims that the skin bird story is true. I kept trying to ask him what he meant by skin bird, though, and he says from what he could remember, this bird didn't have feathers. This doesn't make sense and would obviously defy the laws of physics, I think, but that's his story. Take it as you will. Little Runaway, from NMN. When I was little, I had one of those moments where you threatened to run away, but I actually went through with it. I remember my mom getting mad at me about something and she took away my Game Boy and grounded me for a whole week. I remember being so mad that that night after bedtime, I crawled through my window and just ran into the woods. I wasn't going to stay gone forever, of course. I was just wanting her to see how sad she'd be if I disappeared. So the plan was to wait in the woods until she woke up, 
saw that I was gone, got sad, and then I'd come back. Of course, things never go as planned when you're that little. I must have been five, six years old. Well, anyway, that night I climbed out my window and went into the woods nearby. The woods weren't that big, but I ended up getting myself quite lost in them. I didn't worry about that at first, thinking that I'd find my way back in the morning and that it'd be easy to find your way out of the woods, even though I was dead wrong about that. I huddled down under a canopy of sorts. It was a thick outcropping of bushes and branches that made a sort of cover. It was starting to rain, so I thought that'd be great. So I sat there, trying to stay mad, but I ended up forgetting about why I was even mad in the first place a couple of hours later. Instead, I got sad and a little paranoid. I wanted to go home, but it was cold and wet, and I was lost. I told myself when the sun came up, it'd be warmer, and I'd be able to see better. So by then, I could make it home just fine, right? By midnight or so, I couldn't be sure, I began to hear something that really scared me. It sounded like a child crying. At first, I thought it was me, and I just didn't notice it. But then another child began to cry in the distance from somewhere else. And before I knew it, it wasn't one, two, or three crying sounds. It was a dozen coming from all around me. And they were getting closer. This scared me so bad that I burst from my hiding spot and I looked around. Though the crying was extremely close, it seemed to be coming from nowhere and no one. I was alone but I wasn't. As the crying got closer, I remember thinking I don't want to be there when the crying was right on top of me, so I ran. I ran straight in the opposite direction of that canopy cover thing I hid in. I ran for a long time, but I managed to find my way to a road, one that I vaguely recognized, and I was able to find my home from that road. As I couldn't reach my window from the outside like I thought I'd be able to, I had to crawl in through the front door from the doggy door. But my mom was still up. She caught me, and I got in big trouble. That's my little Lost in the Woods experience. It was creepy. I'm not sure exactly what I heard. But I remember after that having a strange fascination and fear of those woods. I still do. And I kind of want to experience something like that again, hoping that I might actually see where the noises are coming from. But who knows. The Haunted Trailer from James E. F. Back in the 1990s in the state of Virginia, I was a kid. My family lived in a small trailer park. I had two brothers and a sister, and I was the oldest of my siblings. But because of my smaller than average size and my youthful look, I didn't look nearly like I was the oldest. Growing up, I remember my parents mentioning that my youngest brother would get up in the middle of the night, screaming and running around the trailer. My dad would grab him and calm him down, and afterwards he would help my brother back into the bedroom. My baby brother also mentioned that he would see things at night, but I never thought much about it, because I never believed in ghosts or the boogeyman, and thought that the things he saw were just in his head. That is, until I saw something that I'll never forget. One night I got up late. I had to go to the bathroom. Lucky for me, it wasn't too far away from the bedroom that I shared with my brothers. After I flushed the toilet and washed my hands, I turned off the light and I opened the door. But there, standing in our hallway, was something that I still can't explain. I saw some kind of figure right there in the hallway, close to my bedroom door. It was all white so white it almost seemed bright in the dark, but it had no light. I could make out that it had the shape of a human, and that's about all I could see. I couldn't tell what their face looked like, 
I couldn't see the rest of their body, not in detail. At first, I thought it was my mom or dad checking in on me and my siblings. My parents' bedroom was all the way at the other end of the trailer, so I thought I would have heard them if they walked past the bathroom. And even though I thought it was one of my parents, I found myself too scared to ask who they were or what they were doing. I was afraid that if I went to my room, the thing would lunge at me, and I was too scared to go back in the bathroom because I figured it would come after me and try to get in. As I stood there, I then began to think, what if it wasn't my mom or dad? I wanted to scream for help, but I thought if I made any noise at all, this mysterious thing, this figure, would come for me. As I stood there with fear thinking about what I should do, I realized that I couldn't stand there all night. I had to make a decision. I began to move back to my bedroom, never taking my eyes off of the white figure in the hall. I closed the door to my room, got into my bed, and I hid under the covers. For the next few days and nights, things were just normal, and I never thought of the mysterious figure again. That is, until several nights later. I woke up, and I could not sleep for some reason after that. So I lay there on my left side in bed, facing towards the wall. Eventually, I turned over to the right, and there I saw the figure again. Only this time, it was right next to my bed. My brothers and I have a bunk bed, and I sleep on the bottom bunk. Whatever this thing was, it was kneeling next to the bed. I know that it was kneeling. It didn't seem to be as tall when I saw it before. However, after my second encounter with this thing, I finally realized that it wasn't my mom or dad. When I saw it again, I still could not see its face. I wanted to scream like before, but once again, I was afraid. Afraid that if I made any sound, it would try to silence me, attack me. It was so close to me that if it wanted to, it could have managed to hurt me before my parents could reach the room to help. Once again, I pulled the covers and sheets over my head, too scared to sleep, and I hoped it would go away. I never did see the mysterious white human figure again. When I finally had the courage to tell my family what I saw, none of them believed me. My sister and her friends who come over to visit would often tease me whenever they remembered the story. They thought it was funny to joke around and say that they had seen the mysterious thing too. I knew that they were lying though, by the tones of their voices and their laughter. Even my youngest brother who said he would see people at night in his window or in the bedroom never believed my story, especially as he got older. Around the year 2013, my family moved out of the trailer and moved into a new house. We never had to go back. As for my little brother, he would tell people about the things he saw in that trailer as a kid. He would continue to claim they were real, but never believe my own stories. Over the years as we grew up, my sister got married and moved out to live on her own. She started to reveal to people her own tales. Turns out she's now having some strange experiences in the house she lives in now. First Encounters of the Hairy Variety From Raido I grew up in a very rural, poverty-stricken part of North Carolina, about a mile away from Tar River. The area in which I lived was a bit swampy, with heavy, dense woods all around the single-wide home that we lived in. During the summers, when we had abundant time to spend traipsing around the creeks and fields around the area, my siblings and I would spend from dawn until well after dusk playing around in the woods, the river, everywhere, basically. As children, our parents argued a lot. We were very poor and they would frequently fight about jobs and money for days and days. 
so we always preferred to be out of earshot of them. This meant we'd have to play outside, and that meant we played in the forest. Now, we'd always had some experiences around the river, but we could always explain it away. Branches snapping, rocks tossed around, the crunching of leaves in the distance. Nothing was as scary as being at home with them, though. Looking back, I think something was influencing my parents' attitudes and emotions. But that's a whole different story. The first time I saw one, it was just the beginning of fall. The sun had almost gone completely down, leaving a sliver of red and purple that faded into a black abyss. My parents had a huge argument that ended with both of them raging out of the house. My mother sped off in her car, and my dad walked out into the darkness of the woods. As a few hours passed, I began to grow worried about the whereabouts of my dad. So I strapped on my boots, grabbed my dog, and walked out the door. I began to walk around our small backyard, trying to find any clue to where my dad had gone. I looked behind me, and upon the ridge I saw a shadow walking around, the moon illuminating the sky. I decided that must be my father, and ran up to the tall hill to meet him. At the top I looked around, but I didn't see anyone. And then suddenly my dog, a very laid back and soft pit bull, growled this horrible guttural sound. I felt the hair on my neck shoot straight up my arms covered in goosebumps. Without thinking, I shot down the hill, running as quickly as my legs could carry me. As I got to where the property began, I saw my dad sitting on a felled log. He looked angry still, and his expression softened a bit when he saw my face. Dad, were you just up on the hill? I asked. I was exhausted by then. He looked at me perplexed. No, I've been here the whole time. I saw you walk up there and wondered what you were doing, where you were going. He explained. I told him we should probably go back inside, since there's probably a bear around. As we were heading back in, my mother pulled up, got out of her car and told my dad, We need to talk about this. I went inside, figuring they would sit in the car and talk about things. Things that I didn't want to hear about. In the back of our yard, we had a makeshift fire pit, which they had decided to sit around as they talked. About five minutes after I walked inside and began to get ready for bed, I heard banging on our back door. It was my mom. Open this door, now! My room was right beside the back door, so I rushed to it. Unlocking the door to see the terrified faces of my parents tripping over each other to get inside. Then I saw it, standing just outside the line of trees, holding a decent-sized sapling it had snapped. All I could do was stare at it. This thing screamed, a bone-chilling howl. I snapped out of my trance and slammed the weak door closed and locked it. Though I knew if it really wanted to get in, it could just rip the door off the trailer. I stopped going in the woods after that. Every spring and autumn, they would come through. I don't know what they are. I don't know if they migrate, what it is they do at all. But as they come through, they whoop and they holler. They whistle and they scream. They bang on the sides of the trailer. The second time I saw one, I was trying to get some sleep, a hard thing to do when one suffers from insomnia. I finally gave up trying and turned over to get a book to read, when I noticed the shadow being cast on the floor from my window. Slowly, I shifted my gaze up to the window. There, sort of stooping down, stood one of them. It was peering into my window resting one of its hands upon the AC unit outside. It tapped on the glass and let out a low whistle. I lay in my bed, just staring into whatever it was. It stood there letting out various whistles and clicks for about ten minutes, 
before it tapped one last time. Then it stepped back and walked back into the woods. I didn't feel threatened. I think maybe it was just curious. There's a lot of mysterious, weird things that go on in the swampy woods around Tar River in North Carolina. Some things natural, and some things otherworldly. Paranormal Magnet from Xanathar I'm 41 years old, and I've had a life full of strange things that I cannot explain. I'm not one of those types that just believes every little thing I hear or see. I prefer to be skeptical before I make any judgments. That being said, I want to share this experience that happened to me in my early 20s. I was living in Arizona at the time, around late 1997. I used to live in a desert area, close to some large peaks on federal land. I'd found this peak-side cove. Not quite a cave, but a semi-half-cave. I even brought my friend there a couple of times to hike and hang out. One day we rolled some huge boulders off the peak and watched them smash everything below. We had slingshots that we would shoot at rotting cactus, and we would listen to the rocks ricochet. Well, one day I went there all alone. I had an ominous feeling like I was not welcome there, and that danger was near. The next thing I knew, I hear a helicopter in the distance. People really weren't supposed to be on federal land, so I took it as a sign to get the heck out of Dodge. I had a bike which I rode as fast as I could home, which was about two to four miles away. I went to the backyard to soak my head in our pool. It was hot that day. A few seconds later, a black unmarked helicopter shows up literally a mere couple hundred feet from my home's roof, just hovering there, seemingly watching me. I thought to myself, don't look up at it, just pet your dog. Eventually, the helicopter flew away, and I really didn't think much more of it. It was weird. Okay, no big deal. Right? A month or two passed, and things began to get really strange. I never did sleepwalk or have night terrors or any kind of sleep disorder, but I would keep waking up to a cloud or mist that was in a small human-shaped form above me. I would swat at it with pillows or my fist and not know what was going on. Every few months, this would happen. In fact, this kept going on from late 1997 all the way to 2004. Later on, I moved away, got married, and actually moved a few more times. But no matter where I moved, still these clouds followed. My ex-wife even witnessed one at the same time but also mentioned that for a couple of years into the marriage, I would sometimes sit up in my sleep, eyes wide open, and speak seemingly ancient-sounding language. We laughed it all off as silly. Soon, 2004 came. This was the final time I ever had any more sleep disturbances. There was a night when my ex-wife worked very late. Till around 2 or 3 a.m., I was way asleep by this time, or I should have been. Upon her arrival home, there was howling and growling all around our cabin, with no visible, reasonable source like dogs or coyotes to be seen. My ex was scared and got inside very quickly. She could hear more growling inside the home. It was from the room in which I was sleeping. She came into the dark room and saw me standing on the bed, looking contorted. She even thought that my eyes had blackened. She thought I was doing a usual sleepwalking type thing at first, then went to touch me to get me to lay back down, just as she would in the past. However, all hell broke loose. She said my contorted body leapt at her. She screamed and prepared to defend herself, she said I was making some kind of demonic screeching wailing sound. 
I think I partially remember that part. Maybe part of my subconscious was awake or something. But I came to then, and I was as terrified as she was. I had to calm her down after I came to. I told her that I was in control now. It was me, but even my voice was beyond creepy. She claims it sounded like the Indrid Cold voice from that Richard Gere Mothman Prophecies movie. Our bedroom door as well had somehow shut itself and my cat was pacing around frantically to leave. Now you might say it was a night terror. I know what those are and while it seems similar, I had one last experience two weeks later. I had a statue of Apollo. I woke up one night and saw its eyes bright blue. I was scared, but I picked it up and put it away from the window into complete darkness, but somehow its eyes were still glowing. Instead of being afraid, I simply put it on the floor with a blanket over it. And after that, not since 2004, have I woke up seeing something ghostly or cloud-like or strange. I haven't even talked in my sleep. I'm not into religion, but a little bit of faith doesn't hurt, I guess. This may be ridiculous to some, but I know what happened to me was real, and I don't really need to prove it to anyone. I'd love to hear stories from those with similar tales. My house growing up was haunted. From Rosie Thorn 828. I live in New Hampshire in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere. I'm not sure what the exact population of my village is, but you can easily walk from one end of the town to the other in less than half an hour. My town, which I will call Small Place, is on a large lake connected to several smaller lakes. My mom, brother, and I live on one of those smaller lakes. I wanted to tell people about my experiences in this house because they've gotten much worse in the past few months, ever since my grandma died. My grandma, who passed away about 10 months ago, had lived in the house for just over 20 years. No one had owned the house before that. This place was a completely blank slate, which I think is why so many spirits feel at home here. My grandparents are both dead now, but when they were younger, they owned an antique shop, which I suspect held many cursed or haunted items. Eventually, my grandparents retired, and much of what was in the shop moved into my current home with them. My grandpa, or Gramps, my mom's dad, was a bit of a hoarder, so most of the furniture and other knickknacks in the house were his. He collected everything from model soldiers to ventriloquist dummies, even music boxes. And for better or for worse, a lot of these objects had energies about them, and I think some of them had spirits attached to them. One of my first paranormal experiences in the house was from when I was very young. There was a large wooden puppet or doll that always sat behind a bar downstairs in our sitting area. The doll could be seen when you walked up or down the stairs. And for whatever reason, my little brother and I were always scared of it. Anytime we'd go up the stairs, we would hear that puppet creak or see it move out of the corner of our eyes. Then we would sprint back upstairs. Honestly, I never really understood why we kept the dumb thing. But whenever we tried to move it, it would wind up right back at the bottom of the stairs behind the bar. I remember one time when I was 11 or 12, I decided to conduct an experiment of sorts. I moved the doll puppet thingy while everyone was upstairs for dinner, and when we came back down, it had moved. I knew that no one had been downstairs and there was no way the puppet had been brought back to its usual sitting place. This is only one instance of a haunting in my house, and there are many other entities that don't seem to have specific items they're attached to. One of these is the ghost on the stairs. About a year ago, we finally got rid of that doll-slash-puppet from before. 
but for some reason my brother and I still found the stairs to have some negative energy about them, which became even more apparent when we got a dog. We got a Shih Tzu, who we named Charlie. This only happened around a month ago, and it's what prompted me to record my experiences. So my brother and I were hanging out downstairs, when we hear my mom whistle for us. My mom can do this really loud, two-finger whistle that she uses to get our attention when we're playing video games. We head upstairs, and I'm in front of my brother. As I'm going, I stub my toe on something sharp, and I begin to fall. My brother tries to catch me, but I end up causing both of us to fall down the stairs. At that moment, our mom comes in the front door with Charlie, who immediately runs to the top of the stairs and begins to bark like mad, almost like he wants to help, but he's too scared to actually come down the stairs. My brother and I ask my mom what she wanted us for, but she looks confused, telling us she didn't call. She said that she had been out with the dog for 15 minutes. To this day, Jack and I can't figure out who called us, or what I stubbed my toe on. I have a ton of other stories, but those are two of my tamer ones. If you ever want to hear something scarier, I definitely have a lot to share. It ran from CLJ HMN. My fiancé Andrew and I moved into the home I grew up in. The old home had been vacant for years. He enlisted his best friend John to stay with us while he helped do some minor repairs and cleaning. I was pregnant with our daughter at the time. Andrew and I slept in the master bedroom, and John took one of the guest rooms as his own while he stayed. I came home from work one day to find Andrew and John acting weird. They told me hours before I arrived they'd been working in the backyard. John looked up to see a pale woman with dark hair standing at the kitchen window, staring outside in his direction. He called out to Andrew, asking him if I was supposed to be home early. Andrew replied, shaking his head and answering no. By this time, John and Andrew were both looking at the female figure staring back at them. Finally, it backed away from the window and out of view. As they were telling me about this, I got serious goosebumps. However, we decided to ignore the ghostly woman and went about our day. A few days later, Andrew and John were outside working again when they saw the same woman walk down the hallway and past the back door window. Again, I came home to two grown men scared to be in the house without me there. As Andrew is six foot three and 280 pounds, and John himself is a kickboxer, it was a bizarre sight. I found their fear of a ghostly woman almost amusing. Until the night it happened. Fast forward two years and some minor scares later. Small things had happened like cabinet doors being opened when we know they were closed, lights being on when we know they'd all been off. Our daughter had been born in 2009. John had moved out for about a year, but the guest room he slept in was still furnished. Sometimes Andrew and I would sleep in that room because we could watch a movie together and fall asleep there. The night this happened, Andrew and I had just finished a movie and the baby had fallen asleep between us. I wanted to wait a couple more minutes before I moved her to her crib, so I just laid there, not moving and not sleeping. Andrew was on the outside of the bed, also being perfectly still and perhaps on the verge of sleep. We had no pets inside the house, nothing that could explain what happened next. The sound of heavy feet began taking fast steps in the living room, moving quicker and quicker with each step until it was at a dead run down the hallway towards our room and the guest bathroom at the end of the hall. Hearing the first few heavy steps brought me straight up in the bed, and by the time the stomping running feet passed our bedroom door, 
I was stepping over Andrew's legs and onto the floor. It crashed into the bathroom door so hard, the springy doorstop on the bathroom wall was vibrating. Andrew was sitting up in bed, pale with fear, and asked what the heck that was. By this point, I have my hand on the bedroom doorknob. All I can say is, I don't know. Stay with the baby while I go look. I opened the bedroom door and saw the bathroom door still moving slowly back and forth. Scared to death that I might find this huge, heavy thing that had run down my hallway and crashed into the bathroom. Scared to see what uninvited guest was only yards from my tiny baby, I quickly and quietly covered the short distance from bedroom to bathroom. I stopped at the swinging door, and without going into the dark bathroom, I thrust my hand in the direction of the wall switch, flicking on the light. Nothing was there. I took a few more fast steps and yanked the shower curtain back so hard that it tore a few rings out, but there was nothing there. Glad to not have found a psychopath or something, I returned to the bedroom. Andrew was there holding our sleeping baby, sitting up in bed. What was it? What did you see? He asked. Nothing, I replied. Nobody. Whatever crashed into the door is gone. But where did it go? There's no way for it to leave. The bathroom window is too small for anyone to shimmy through, he said. I shook my head. I don't know was the only answer I had. He stayed in the guest bedroom with our baby while I checked the rest of the house. It was empty, so I locked up. No surprise there. I always made sure the place was locked every night. We were so scared and shaken we decided to spend the rest of the night at his dad's house, 45 minutes away. We loaded up the baby and her things. And then we left. We didn't speak of what happened until the next day. With the light of the day, it didn't seem any less scary, but we were able to return home. But we never slept in that room again. The Man in the Smiley Mask from Nolan A. The woods have always been my safe place. They were when I was eight years old. I was a bullied kid. Now that I'm 20 years old, the woods still are my safe place. But that all changed about a week ago. My house is in a fairly suburban area, just a few minutes of a walk from a forest that was barely saved from removal by locals. The area is known as Weona Park. Those woods are a favorite of joggers and people just out for a stroll, especially in the fall, when nature is at her best. I had gotten home early from work one day and decided to take an hour to enjoy the forest, so I put on my coat, walked down the hill to the entrance of the woods. The leaves made that satisfying crunch underneath my feet, and the colors reminded me of Thanksgiving. I popped in my headphones and played a couple of old Billy Joel songs, my favorites. Life seemed good. Eventually, I realized that I only had a bit left to walk, so I took a turn to go deeper into the woods. I continued to walk, but then my music suddenly cut out. I took my headphones out, checked the connection, then I checked the battery on my device. Everything seemed fine. But now that I could hear my surroundings, I couldn't hear my surroundings, because everything had gone eerily quiet. And it was dark, too. A little too dark for an early afternoon. I placed my headphones back into my ears, and I tried to play more music. But what came out instead of music caused me to jump. It was a loud burst of static that stabbed into my ear canals, the hell? I muttered, breathing heavily, yanking out the headphones again. A moment later, that phrase I'd just spoken was echoed around me. The hell? I was dumbstruck. That didn't seem like a normal echo, so I tested it with a whistle. And a moment later, I heard the echo again, 
of my exact whistle. Only, once again, it did not sound like a proper echo. It was as if someone was recording me, mocking me. I looked around, and I saw nothing but the darkness of the forest. My phone then vibrated, and I looked down to see a text from a number I did not recognize. I opened it. It was a picture of me, standing right where I was then, looking down at my phone. The picture was taken only a few seconds ago, from my left. I quickly glanced in that direction, but saw nothing. The picture hadn't been taken from very far away, and it was still light enough for me to see a couple of yards in front of me, so something should have been there. I should have seen someone, at least, taking photos. My phone vibrated again, and I glanced back down to see another picture of me, this time from the right. I freaked out and backed from that direction. I texted back, Who are you? I received another picture of me. I began to back away from the deeper area of the woods. My heart was pounding and my innards felt like ice. I had no idea where the person was, but I needed to know, because if I ran in the wrong direction, I could be heading right towards them. I called their number, and I waited to hear a ring. My phone said, connecting, and I waited. Then, I heard a ring behind me. My heart leapt into my throat, and my legs went weak. I slowly turned to face the sound, but the ringing stopped as my eyes fell on someone. They were over six feet tall, much taller than I was. I remember them wearing a black tactical jacket and a hoodie, but what I mostly focused on was their mask. It was yellow and it had a tight smile with square teeth, two squinting eyes, but no nose. It looked like some kind of demonic emoji. I screamed and I ran, following the trail I used to love. I didn't stop running until I made it home. Every time I'd look back, I'd see them not too far behind me, but somehow I never saw them run. They would just be standing still, watching me. I had never been so scared in my life. When I got home, I fumbled with the keys and I ran inside. That was the most terrifying moment of my life. It was the kind of feeling where you curved your back and you pushed all your force forward just to get away. Once I was inside, I locked all the doors and windows, then I grabbed a knife and I stayed in bed for the rest of the night, waiting, listening. To this day, I never went back into those woods. I bought a new phone too. Even though I deleted those texts, I didn't want him to be able to contact me or find me. Sometimes though, I do walk a little close to those woods and I find myself staring at the trees, trembling, and I wonder who or what was behind that mask. Skinwalker Encounters from Dread 445 Part 1 I'm a Native American from the Navajo tribe. I lived on the Navajo reservation near Four Corners for about eight years, and I knew about skinwalkers. I knew about them my whole life. My family always told me not to talk about them, not to mention anything about them, as it is said to attract them, but I did anyways with my cousins. We didn't care as much as our elders did, but maybe we should have. Back then, I wondered why people were so afraid of them, these skinwalkers or gloshies. You always hear about people freaking out the moment they come across one or hear one, 
but that's what they do. They like to scare people, because in reality, skinwalkers aren't supposed to be able to harm you. Not physically, not if you're not afraid of them. The worst they can do is blow powder in your face and get you sick for a while, or try to curse you. But there are ways to get rid of a skinwalker, like using ashes from a fireplace and sprinkling them around your home, or you can keep a pouch of them and throw it at them if the time comes. That's the way I've always been told. I learned it all from my grandfather who is a medicine man, so naturally I took his lesson. He still practices his medicine man career, doing peyote ceremonies and other things, some of which I don't remember well, but he always warned us about not going out at night. I've had what I believe to be three separate encounters with skinwalkers, and now I know that whole don't go out at night thing is something I should definitely take more seriously. The first encounter happened when I was six. Me and my mother were driving to a city near us because we lived out in the hills about 50 miles from the nearest town. My mother ended up forgetting to fuel up from the day before, so we were stuck on the road waiting for anyone to pick us up, but no one came and my mother told me we would have to walk back home. Then we could call my father to get fuel when he comes back. We were about three miles away from home. It may not seem far, but walking in the dark on a dirt road, trees surrounding you on either side, with no street lights, knowing that wolves or coyotes or even a cougar could attack you, that's a bit creepy, but we continued to walk. About a mile in, I started to hear someone throwing rocks at the trees lightly. I quickly told my mother, but she told me not to look or acknowledge the noise, because that's what they wanted. I began to understand what she meant. We kept on walking, not paying the forest any mind, until we heard a dog whimpering in the trees. Once again, I told my mother, but she told me the same thing. The noise started to change from a dog's to a man's voice, one that I remember clearly saying, Hey, look, over here. I felt my body tense up, and my blood began to rush. I knew I couldn't look, but it kept saying my name about four times in a row, and then it began to run ahead of us. I could make out a dark figure running between the trees, I know my mother saw it too, but she told me not to run, because then it would start chasing us. I listened to her, swallowing hard and trying my best not to be afraid. I asked her if she could hear it calling out to me, but she didn't. She said if I heard it again, I should ignore it as much as possible, so we kept walking, now only a mile away. It was then that we saw a dog in the middle of the road. It was a brown and black mutt, and it sat there looking at us while we walked around it. Now, my mother always has a little pouch of ashes that she kept all over the place for situations like this. She was just about to pull it out when the creature ran. My mother told me we would have to walk a little bit faster now. Then we heard the shrieks. They were loud, sounding like a rooster crowing, mixed with a dog yelping. We continued to walk at the same pace, until finally we made it back home, and we waited there for my father. But that didn't stop it from trying to bother us. Something began to knock on the door, just barely, and it was walking on the roof after that. My mother wasn't afraid, because she took out my grandfather's 12-gauge, and held it till the noise went away. Three hours later, my father came home to pick up my mother and to get the car in the road. Part two. When I was 10 years old, we moved to a city. My parents dropped me off at my Nale during the summer break after the school year was over. One night I was alone. My family was in the city working and my Nali went to a casino. I was at her place watching movies. I was also playing SpongeBob the movie game on my GameCube. 
An underrated game, by the way. When I suddenly began to hear the dogs barking all around me. My family had a few dogs to let us know if something was around, but all of them began to bark, yet I didn't know why. But then, I heard a light tapping on the window. I actually didn't go check, because by then I knew what it was. It began to get a little bit louder, trying to get my attention, but it stopped. Then, it started to move along the walls, tapping all around. This time around, I was feeling more irritated, so I figured I'd do something about it. I got some ashes from the fireplace, and I placed them next to me, in case it tried to get in. Then I continued to play the game, ignoring it. But then, it crawled on the roof, and I could hear it walking around up there. In my head, I was like, what the heck, this dude really got on the roof. It kept on going until my Nale came home. I told her about it, and she laughed at me, saying that there was one that always did that crap, and asked if it scared me. I was honest with her, and told her it did a little bit, but I ignored it after a while. She laughed again, and told me to go to bed, and that was that. Part 3 The third incident happened when I was 13. This one I actually messed up, because I didn't put an ash circle around the house like my Nolly told me to. A couple of days before, all the same stuff happened. It was nighttime, and I was starting to get sleepy around 9 or 10, so I went to bed. But while I slept, I had a horrible nightmare. I woke up in the dark. The only light I had on my face was through a window from the moonlight. This window was on the wall between the kitchen and the living room where I was sleeping. I peered into the kitchen, which was pitch black. Everything seemed fine, so I tried to go back to sleep, when suddenly, I felt just wrong. A feeling of dread came over me. I looked around again, but I couldn't see anything there, but I knew something was. I kept trying to search for something, when finally, it moved slightly towards the light a bit. I was stunned. I was looking at this dark figure that had a head shaped like a dog's. Perhaps it was wearing the dog's skin. But I was immediately struck with the smell of wet dog, compost, and rotting animal. I froze, then desperately tried to call out to my Nale, but my voice felt as if it was being squeezed. I could only let out a hoarse whisper. I looked back at the figure, but it didn't move. It seemed to be staring in at me. For the next several minutes, heck, it could have been an hour, I couldn't do anything. I decided to try to ignore it, like my parents always told me, so I turned around and I squeezed my eyelids shut. The following day, the sun shone through all around, and I remembered immediately what happened last night. My Nale walks up to me asking if I woke up earlier. I asked her why. She said, well, because someone left the front door open. That creeped me out. And now that I'm older, I think I've gotten used to them. And luckily, I know what to do when the worst happens. Sleeping Creature from Eveline S. This encounter took place 10 years ago in a forest located between Bouzonson and Ornon in the east of France. I must first of all say that I've always loved nature. As a child, until I was a teenager, I used to get up early in the morning before everyone, around 6 a.m. I went out in muffled steps to avoid waking my parents and brothers. I would go for a walk every morning in the wilderness for two hours, before returning to have breakfast and to go to school. So I was used to my solitary walks for a long time. Later on, I would have to give up this habit, because I had to leave to continue my studies, and because I was a boarder in high school. The years have passed, 
In 2009, as in previous years, I used to go to a forest near Ornon to look for mushrooms. I could go far enough without ever feeling the least concern. It was a beautiful coniferous forest. That week it was in August. I was unusually nervous out there, and I didn't really understand why. The weather was gorgeous, but something bothered me. Several times I rushed to pick up my mushrooms, and I would quickly leave the woods, then jump into my car, leaving as fast as possible. On the way back, I said to myself, what's wrong with you? But hey, I forgot about it and came back the next day. It was then that I finally understood the reason for my concern. After picking up some mushrooms, I got up and understood what was bothering me. It was the silence there. I listened. I could hear my heart beating extra hard, but nothing else. Once again, I left quickly. One morning, I arrived around 7.30. It was the best time to go for mushrooms before others passed through. I embarked on a trail that I had not explored yet. I soon stumbled upon a dark mass. It was about 60 meters away from me, but I could see it. I thought it was a tree stump at first. I began walking while looking at the ground, picking some mushrooms and going about my business. I eventually made it up to that mass and I looked up in front of me. I was shocked. I tried to understand what I was looking at because it definitely was not a tree stump. It was some sort of animal curled up on itself, muzzle resting on the chest. The posture was very strange. It looked like someone crouching. Its fur was a black gray, like that of a boar, but darker. And above all, it wasn't a boar either. I know what a boar looks like, my companion being a hunter himself. My heart began to beat like crazy again. I could hear it thumping through my ears. I was terrified this creature would hear it. I began to recoil and backstep. My fear was so visceral. I'd never felt that way before. I ended up spinning and running without daring to return. I made it back to my car and pressed the accelerator. Back home, I didn't dare tell my companion about this. I simply asked him if he'd ever come up on a boar sleeping or sitting. Of course, he laughed at me, wondering why I asked such a sudden and odd question. During the day one day, I decided to return to the scene. I cautiously advanced my car up the trail, and I leaned over to watch, and that supposed stump was gone. So what I had walked up on was definitely a living creature of some sort. From that day forward, I didn't go that deep into the woods anymore. If I was going back in for mushrooms, I would only go back in a few meters. About a year ago, I saw Nuria TV's show about the dogman myth or reality, and this is where I'll put a name to what I saw, because the reports that show talks about, they're very similar to what I saw. Which animal do you think would sleep squatting like a person? Creature by the Tent from Insulting There's always something that happens in your life that you'll never forget, and this is one of them. It happened 15 years ago when I was 14. It was a simple camping trip with my family and my best friend, Brian. We live in a small town in West Virginia, and this creepy encounter happened on a small camping spot down in Lower Glady. This was the first time I was allowed to bring a friend camping, and I wanted to bring someone who knew about fishing and nature. Brian was a sure pick, and was one of my best friends at the time. We packed up early, and left to pick him up at his grandparents' house. It's only around 50 minutes or so to get to the camping spot, but let me tell you, it's in the lower mountains and far away from anyone else, or any sort of help. Once we got there, we set up camp. Me and Brian had our own tent while my parents set up their tent across from us. 
Our tent, because we were living dangerously, was set up right next to a tree line with a bunch of vegetation blocking our sight from looking into the forest. The campsite was kind of in the open, but surrounded by trees and a nice creek for fishing. So after we set up, me and Brian went with my dad to try and catch some rainbow trout for cooking. This is where the first part of the encounter happened. As anyone knows, when you're young, your parents won't believe you most of the time when you see something odd. While fishing, we all three kind of split up to cover more water holes. As I throw my spinner in the water, bam, I got a monster rainbow right on the line. While I'm fighting this fish, I swear I could see a shadow of a tall figure across the creek. It was looking down at me from behind a tree. I began to look at it when my dad yelled at me, telling me he's coming and he's bringing the net. Just as he says that, I look towards him, then back at the tree, and the figure is gone. After I fight the fish for a while and we net the beauty, I proceed to tell my dad what I saw, but he shrugs it away like I was just overly excited and didn't see anything. We head back to camp. The fire is burning hot and we're cooking this big fish up. While it's cooking, I'm in my tent with Brian and was telling him about what I saw. Believe it or not, he swears he saw the figure too. But for him, he saw it behind a different tree. Which means there were multiple creatures and all of them were watching me pull that trout out. After all that chatting, we began to eat dinner. It was getting dark out then. My dad brings out his American honey whiskey and starts hitting it hard. Around 11 p.m. or so, he's passed out next to the fire, lying on the trunk of a tree, while my mom was smart enough to get in their tent and pass out. Of course, me and Brian were young and full of energy, and we wanted to stay up late. We're starting to tell ghost stories trying to scare each other. That's when we began to hear branches starting to bend and to break outside the tent. Just then, something gets knocked off the table outside and onto the ground. I'm sitting there under my sleeping bag, absolutely terrified. Brian looks at me and says we have to see what it is. So we get up, and we slowly start to unzip the zipper. It's just a dough. Her front legs are on the table and she's chewing on some bread we left out. We get out of the tent and the deer is still eating away, even though we're only a few feet from it. Just as I take a step, what sounded like someone knocking a freaking tree down sounds off to our right. The deer jerks up and looks at us, then looks back in the woods before taking off. Brian, being the idiot he was, takes a big rock from the ground and chucks it into the air and towards the woods. We can hear the rock crashing down through the branches, but just then, instead of a light sound of the rock hitting the ground, we hear this horrible, terrible scream of some animal yelling in the woods. We look at each other, then jump back into our tent. We zip the zipper up and get under the sleeping bag. Just as we do that, we can hear branches snapping and bushes moving around. I look at Brian and said, holy crap, something's coming. The firelight made a shadow of it on our tent. It was huge, some sort of animal. All I could see was an outline of possibly a man or something bigger. It seemed to be seven feet or so, and the fingers on its hands ended in points. I look over at Brian, and I whispered to him, my dad's out there. As much as I wanted to be a hero, I couldn't move from our tent. All I could do was hide under my sleeping bag as I heard the table being knocked over and our food being torn up. But as fast as it happened, it was gone. We wanted to look outside the tent, but were so scared that we ended up falling asleep while hiding in our sleeping bags. At daybreak, the light comes through the tent I jump up and out of my sleeping bag and open the tent zipper. And my dad is there, still fast asleep in the same spot. He's perfectly fine. As for everything else, it looked like a tornado came ripping through the campsite, knocking everything over. 
Brian started tapping me. He then pointed into the woods and you could actually see where something huge knocked over some small dead trees, smashed through some bushes, and even left somewhat of a dirty hand or claw print on the side of my tent. My parents still didn't believe us despite seeing all of this. They shrugged it off as a bear. After we packed up, Brian and I told my parents one second we were going to walk in the woods and look at something. What we actually looked at was the rock that he threw, but what we found was much worse. It was a doe, maybe the one from the night before, its belly ripped open, legs mangled. They never believed us anyway, so we never told my parents about what we found. And sadly, Brian never went camping with me again. But would you? <laughs>